I do have a kind streak. You are courageous, man. Boys I, and girls, have, welcome. Welcome to Saturday, March 23rd, 2024. It's 939 in the Salt Lake Valley, and we are here with the courageous brother Tommy and the chicken, Dale. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? I'm not seeing you live on YouTube. Oh yeah. I don't. I don't understand what's going on here. I, I when I knew you were going live, I immediately went there so I could mute it. I'm gonna refresh it. Okay. It takes a second, yeah, for it to come through. Yep. Yep. I had to refresh. Okay, we're good. <clears throat> you got is um, yeah today i thought we'd spend some time with ephesians chapter one and the opening of ephesians chapter one says blessed be the god of our lord jesus christ and i'm a little bit hesitant to point out this uh chapter one verse three blessed be the god of our lord jesus christ because you know that would basically be picking a fight with the trinitarians and they just love to fight but what do we got? How come we can, Paul can say, blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we don't say it. <laughs> Are we chicken? Yeah, we don't want to win, lose the fight to the Trinitarians. They never say, blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Anyway, but we'll spend some time later on looking at Ephesians chapter 1 and seeing if we can pick up some depth and beauty there. Oh, and did you guys see last night's show? Go back and see last night's show. It was in, entitled um, A Review of Seth Fallenkamp's essay or dialogue called No Signs for You. It's really a good show. Seth had some wonderful things to say for all of us. And, and uh, if I can give it in a nutshell... Uh, it was, Seth was saying, no signs for you because the Jews seek signs, right? Paul said the Jews seek signs and the Greeks seek wisdom, but all we got is the cross. And so Seth was saying, we don't have signs. There's no, no way in hell that we should understand that if you become a Christian, your life will get easy. And so he was going on and on about, everybody's got a hard time going on. Everybody's got something in the arena of suffering, whether it's physical suffering or mental suffering or financial suffering. I mean, this is our lot, but nobody gets out of it. Just because you start believing God doesn't mean you're going to get out of suffering. You might even get a little more suffering. Nobody gets out of here without, with signs and miracles. We all get in here and we stay in here with suffering until God is pleased with it all because this is God's doing. Anyway, I'm, I'm really abusing Seth's uh, talk. It was lovely and passionate and from the heart. And I would recommend that you go back and listen to it. It, it, would, it would be hard to beat Seth. If you, if you have a sermon that you think you can beat Seth, okay, I want to hear it. Because it was great. <laughs> what? No, thanks. <laughs> <clears throat> so did you hear the show last night dale i did oh man wasn't it lovely if you said something i didn't hear it i said yeah yeah, yeah. how about you tommy did you see the show last night it, yes i saw a substantial portion of it impressive huh coming from a young brother yes yes yeah. i had to i have a kind streak and i had to exercise a little kindness which i occasionally have and not come in and you know parade or do my shtick you know i considered it a, a kindness that i might be what is that word that word of meaning yeah I consider the kindness not to be overweening on occasion. Overweening, yeah. 
that is a, a word we don't use very much. That really helped me uh, in discovering that word here in this venue. You know, what is overweening? And uh, yeah, that helped, that helped me. I mean, you might not be able to tell, but it helped me understand myself a little bit deeper maybe. Yeah, according to our discovery about this overweening business, I forgot which of Paul's letters it's in. I think Romans might be Corinthians. But uh, it turns out that the word overweening is would cover both ends of the spectrum, either thinking too highly of yourself or thinking too lowly of yourself. Either way, yourself is all that you're thinking about, right? And so both directions would be um, rude. <laughs> and impolite <laughs> to think too highly of yourself or too lowly of yourself. Either way, all you're doing is talking about yourself and your gloriousness or lot lack thereof. Wow. Um. Yeah, you know, thinking too lowly of yourself has a reputation as humility. But, but is but it really? No, I think thinking of yourself most truly is actually humility. But anyway, uh, I must go. I have a prior appointment. Thank you for your hospitality, brothers. Okay, St. Tommy of, of the East Coast. <laughs> goodbye. 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 What if you're, what if you're honest? Um, what was the word he used? Um, Overweening? No, uh, I was spinning off of Tommy. Uh, what, what What if you genu genuinely think you're a piece of shit? Uh-huh. <laughs> Is that prideful? I mean, <laughs> give me a break. <laughs> On a second, I'm trying to get over there to pin the uh, StreamYard link to the top. It takes time to click this button and that button and the other button, you know what I mean? Instant gratification. Here we come. Well, let's bring up this uh, episode. Now, from time to time, I like to watch uh, gardening and farming and permaculture videos and this one has something to do with the islands of arizona i did, have not seen this so i can't give you a, a prequel on it so i was but just gonna ask i was just gonna ask didn't isn't that something we saw a week or two ago i don't know the, a week or two ago we saw an episode about how to bring water to the desert yeah, okay. We're harvesting the rainwater in the desert. I don't know what this right. one is about. The islands of Arizona? Oh. Let's see. And stand by the ready in case you or I have a comment. Okay. Out of the grass and the desert shrubs, the Arizona desert emerges islands. Can you These turn it up a little bit? You would traditionally think of as islands. These are massive um. mountains that are radically different. It's all the way up. On a okay, thank you. Surrounding desert climates. These mountains are known as the Madrian Sky Islands. They are my absolute favorite part of Arizona when it comes to hiking and just overall existing. They are part of the Basin and Range Province, which expands from parts of Mexico all the way up into the very northern parts of Nevada. But for the sake of this video, we're focused on this very little part of the basin and range called the Sierra Madre Occidental Islands or the Madrian Sky Islands. So just a little overview on how these islands formed. They formed from horsed and graben topography. So as the crust extends, which was happening in the basin and range province at the time, 
you get these faults, and if two normal faults form, it can create these areas where the crest sinks, forming gravens, which are valleys, and horse, which are above the gravens, which are ridges. Now, horse and graven topography alone cannot account for the large elevation that these mountains achieve, so we have to look to another geologic force called lithosphere delamination. So the crest, as well as a very tiny part of the upper mantle, I'll hit pause. Of the earth <clears throat> yeah, I think that we should uh, we should get a law passed to stop tectonic plate activity. <laughs> there you go. You mock my pain. Yeah. All right, hit play. <laughs> okay. Called the lithosphere, and so very thick. Parts of the lithosphere can have the bottom parts of that lithosphere break off and go deeper down into the mantle, causing mantle upwelling, which fills those gaps and uplifts the terrain above it, thus creating for bigger mountains and higher elevation valleys. Now, some of these mountains contain the five of the nine life zones found on Earth, and life zones are essentially just areas where the Plants and animals are similar, but for the sake of this video, we're going to be talking about biomes, and these mountains tend to have eight, so let's go over all the eight biomes real quick. So first up, we have the desert. Okay, uh, hit pause. This is where you're going. Um, have you ever spent any time in the mountains, Dale? A little bit. I, I like uh, a little bit. I used to live in the mountains above Santa Barbara. And it, it wasn't very far away from Santa Barbara. It was like no more than 20, 25 miles, right? And you would think you'd get there really fast because it's only 25 miles away. That's like 20 minutes, right? Going to 60 miles an hour or whatever. But you had to drive down this curvy road and you could only go 15 miles an hour around these curves. It was so curvy. But having lived there for a number of years, I noticed that as you're climbing up the mountain, like every 500 feet, there would be a new kind of vegetation. And that vegetation would never leave that, that area, that 500 feet climb. After you hit past that 500 foot area, you'd enter into a new kind of vegetation. And they, kind of, they apparently love that height or zone. And I just thought it was interesting that, that every time you climbed up X amount of feet, There'd be a new kind of vegetation that would only grow there for some odd reason. Right. Kind of like tree lines. I mean, above a certain level, trees can't can't exist, I guess. Or don't exist. Or they're yeah, yeah what are they looking for? Yeah. Um, kind of like the Christians. <laughs> what are they looking for? <laughs> what do they want? <laughs> okay, it play to find your saguaro cactus as well as many other species of cacti as well as creosote bushes and a lot of other scrubs uh, these regions are generally going to be found in low elevation one to two thousand feet above sea level next up we have the desert grasslands these are between like two to three thousand feet above sea level lots of grass here very cool during monsoon season lots of flowers uh, this is where you're also going to find species of mesquite trees as well as yuccas. Next up, we have the oak grasslands, which is between three to four thousand feet elevation. Again, this is where you're going to find Arizona white oak, emery oak, and Arizona juniper. Next, we have the oak woodlands between four and five thousand feet elevation. Again, this is where you're going to find every other oak I mentioned earlier, along with Madrian oak. Next, we have the chaparral biome. This is where you're going to find pinyon pines, scrub oak, agave, juniper, and manzanita. Next, we got the pine oak woodlands. This is where you're going to find a lot of the species of oak I previously mentioned, along with ponderosa pine, as well as Douglas fir. It's between around five to 6,000 feet above sea level. Next, we have the pine forest biome at around six to 7,000 feet above sea level. This is where you're going to find a lot of those pine trees I mentioned earlier. This is where a lot of the oak gets shred off, but you still see some gamble oak and the addition of white pine. 
Rest up between 7 to 11,000 feet above sea level, we have the mixed conifer biome. This is where you're going to see a lot of those pine trees and conifers I mentioned beforehand, but also with the addition of quaking aspen. This is also the wettest region of the mountain, and this is why. As Pacific storms as well as monsoonal storms come to these mountains, the water that's inside of these storm clouds condenses as it travels up the slopes of the mountains and becomes colder thus allowing for a lot more rain to fall on these higher elevations where that condensation is very intense. I'm just going to show a brief example of monsoonal storms that happen because the land heats up faster than the ocean in the summer, which causes a pressure differential and the moist air above the ocean tends to want to move to that hot air above the land because hotter air can hold more moisture. Now, part of the reason why the Madrian Skylands are so diverse is because they sit in the middle, right between the Colorado Plateau and the Sierra Madre Occidental, which is a major mountain range in Mexico. So they get a variety of species from each. But let's talk a little bit about those animal species. There's over 450 species of birds, over 100 species of mammals, and around 100 species of reptiles. I'm going to go over some favorites from each category. Right here is a Rivoli's hummingbird. Wow. Next we have an acorn woodpecker. And we have an elegant trogon. Beautiful. Here's an Ela monster. Love these dudes. They're so cute. Not so beautiful. And we have a western diamondback rattlesnake. Little Ooh, lesky. yuppie. And we have a horned lizard, also called a horny toed lizard, which I think is kind of funny. And we have a classic American black bear. And we have the cutest animal on earth, a Cotamundi. Love these guys. And then, weirdly, we have jaguars in this section of the country that naturally roam here. Super beautiful. Now that we've talked a bit about the ecology and geology of the native Skylands, let's talk a little bit about their native inhabitants. So here we have the Maricopa tribe which were known for their basket weaving as well as their textiles and pottery. Here's an example of pottery. Another tribe was the Tohono de Orem. They were known for their agriculture as well as their canal building for agricultural systems. Another major tribe in the region was the Apache peoples, who were most notably known for putting up a great defense against the U.S. expansion into the West. They really resisted hard. Here is their one of their warrior leaders, Geronimo, who put up many battles against the U.S. government until he was eventually captured near the Madrian Sky Islands in okay, 1886. Now the do you know the backstory of Geronimo? I do not. Well, what people know about him popularly is that he would fight the soldiers the cavalry, but the backstory makes it understandable. You know how we talk about there's no such thing as free will on a regular basis that, that everybody has a will, but it's always influenced by various things. So it turns out that Geronimo was married and had a couple of kids and he was a nice, peaceful Indian and he and his family would make things. And so one day he took his things into town to to trade them you know for whatever cash or food or whatever it, it, things like baskets or clothing or indian clothing or moccasins i don't know what they were but he took them into town to to trade and while he was in town the damn u.s federal yankee soldiers charged into his village that had no men left there and they killed all the women and the children, including Geronimo's wife and children. And uh, when he came back and saw the disaster, uh, he was so wounded. You know, he more or less cried for a couple of years. He grieved for a couple of years. And then finally, uh, he, he snapped out of it and decided to take revenge on the Calvary. Wow and declared all kinds of war on them using guerrilla warfare techniques. And he was really hard to deal with for the cavalry because he didn't play by their rules. He, he was sneaky. 
anyway, but but knowing that he became the warrior Geronimo because of the Calvary's actions and their treachery and their crimes against his family and his uh, his tribe. I think that's interesting. Cause interesting causal factors, eh? Yes. Yes. I mean, any one of us could have been Geronimo. For sure. You know, if we go into town to do some trade with the white man and the white man's soldiers come in and kill our wives, and rape our wives and children and kill them all. Fuck that, man. That's <laughs> that's understandable that why Geronimo would become Geronimo. I'm sure. Anyway, okay, hip lay. Captured near the Madrian Sky Islands in 1886. Now, the native history of southeastern Arizona cannot be told without including one of the most horrific massacres in Native American history within the Arizona region, the Camp Grant Massacre of 1871. So things start off with Chief Eskiminzen of the Aravipa Apaches moving his 500 peoples to the Camp Grant area, which was maintained by a Lieutenant Royal Whitman at the time. He wanted to move his people to the area so that they could farm a creek nearby and set up a camp, which Whitman permitted. Around the same time, a different tribe, a couple miles away, ransacked a train. Did he say which Whitman permitted? Yeah. Yeah, permitted. Right. Killed two men, stole mules. A month later, they potentially kidnapped a Mexican woman. And this sparked a lot of outrage in the nearby emerging city of Tucson. And then, a couple months later, a man was seen stealing 19 cattle from a nearby ranch. He was followed by Papagos Indians, who notoriously disliked the Apache, who followed and killed the man and identified him as an Aravipa Apache. After this, more outrage was sparked, and a group of 48 Mexicans, 6 Americans, and 94 Papagos natives gathered in Tucson and made their way to Camp Grant. They happened to arrive when the majority of the Apache men were out on a hunt and Whitman was away. They ended up massacring 8 men, 110 women and children, and kidnapping 28 babies to sell into slavery. Only one woman was left alive. Back in the late 1600s, 1692, missions like San Xavier del Bac were established in order to convert the native populations to Christianity, led by Spanish missionaries. This was followed by a period in the 1800s where there was a lot of ranching and mining Here's the mining town of Bisbee, and this is the lavender pit mine that was established in the 1800s that was specifically meant mainly for the purpose of extracting copper. Now for the lighter and fun stuff, let's talk about some of the magnificent hiking in this region. Right here we're looking at Chiricahua National Monument in the very southeastern corner of Arizona in the Chiricahua Mountains. This was formed by an ancient volcano that exploded and formed the Turkey Creek caldera, which layered down a bunch of ash that eroded away and left these really cool hoodoos. This is an absolutely wonderful collection of hoodoos. They look a lot more girthy and a lot more dynamic than the ones that you would see in Bryce Canyon. There's a lot of cool ones that are balancing on stuff, the ones that you would see in Bryce Canyon. Look at that thing teetering. <laughs> what would it take to knock that sucker over? Uh, a strong wind? <laughs> I, I don't know. How, how big is that? <laughs> oh, Probably my. a very strong wind. How about that? <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. There's a lot of cool ones that are balancing oh. and stuff. There's entire valleys where it's just spikes everywhere like this picture here 
it's a phenomenal area and it's a really good way to walk through those Sierra Madre Occidental Pine Oak forests that I was discussing earlier. Here we have a different mountain called Mount Wrightson, which is a little further inland from the Arizona-Mexico border, uh, right outside of the town of Green Valley. Super beautiful area, absolutely stunning views of the peak when you're heading up there. I head all the way up to the top when I was there. Some absolutely gorgeous scenery of the forests and the uh, chaparral biome that you go through. A uh, really dynamic, really cool hike with some very sweeping views of Arizona, and you can even see all the way from Mexico if you're high enough on these peaks. It's uh, just a fascinating area in general, and you're not going to see much people on the trail. Uh, when I was on the peak this one day, I think in May, which is a really perfect time to hike, there was nobody there. Here next in Saguaro National Park, we have Rincon Peak, which I think is a great peak to just show you the sheer amount of biome difference in the Madrian Sky Island region. So this hike starts you off like all the way at the bottom of this mountain, and you hike through almost every single life zone. Starts you off in those oak grasslands, and then you just make your way up through the chaparral, into the oak woodlands, into the pine oak, into the pine forest, into the mixed conifer biome at the top. It's a really dynamic, really versatile hike. And since you have to hike so far, not many people are back there. And so next we have Miller Peak in the Huachuca Range right outside of Sierra Vista. This is where the start of the Arizona Trail runs through. Super beautiful area. Again, you're not going to see much people hiking through this area, especially when you take that Miller Canyon trail up to the top of Miller Peak. This is another one of those hikes where you can see a lot of the life zones. And if you come at the right time of year, you're going to see a lot of color changing oak and sycamore along the creeks. Here we have Patagonia Lake. No, this is not the Patagonia in South America. This is Patagonia in Arizona. Still very beautiful. This was pictures I took right around the time of monsoon season, so just a beautiful time to be there. Lots of flowers popping about. It was just a really gorgeous time to go. Lots of good wine country there, too. Here's some pictures from Coronado National Monument, named after Francisco de Coronado, who was one of the first European colonizers to really explore this region. Nearby, you have Ramsey Canyon, which has one of the highest densities of hummingbird species anywhere in the U.S. with super beautiful views and a nice year-round creek going through it. And then this is just a really nice picture that I took out of the town of Bisbee, Arizona, up in the highlands. Uh, I think that area is absolutely stunning looking down into Mexico. Thank you all so much for watching. I know this was a longer video, but thanks for sticking in there. This right here is a picture of some waterfalls you can see in Saguaro National Park if you go at the right time of year. So I hope this video encourages you to check out the Madrian Sky Island region. It's, it's really a region of the U.S. that is close to my heart. Uh, just a reminder to get out and hike. And as always, the links for everything, all the sources and all the hikes is down below. Thank you so much for watching. Amazing. <clears throat> How'd you like that one? I'm sorry, I was muted. Didn't realize it. I especially like those weird uh, spiky things. Well, the one that I, I paused on and talked uh -huh. about what, what would it take to knock that sucker over. It, it just how unusual. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah so god was bored that day he said hey let's see if i can create something that'll puzzle <laughs> the hell out of dale in michigan <laughs> there, there you go <laughs> this doesn't reminds, make any sense <laughs> reminds me of the roadrunner cartoons oh yeah See that one in the corner? I found this hiking. Yeah. Click on that. Let's watch that. 
Jim was something that I've never encountered before. He seemed like a really nice teacher. Sometimes, as we explore the world around us, we are fortunate enough to stumble upon features that excite and puzzle us all at the same time. It can be quite an adventure looking for clues, making observations, and developing theories as to the origin of mysterious features. Why, hello out there. I'm Marlon Cook. <laughs> One of the well, many things that. I enjoy about geology is as I hike around, I see things that other people that don't have geology skills don't even see or aren't able to enjoy. So it makes my hikes more enjoyable, I'd like to think anyway. And as you go along with me on videos, I, I hope paused. that you'll gain this. So uh, way back in the early 90s, uh, my my then father-in-law was a retired geologist. And I mm -hmm. went for a hike with him. He lived in Mesquite, Nevada at the time. I went for a hike with him out in Mesquite. And he he waved his hand across the horizon at this small mountain that looked like it had been cut, you know. Uh, and he said, you can see the whole history of this uh, valley right here in that, uh, that mountain cut. <laughs> I go, I don't know what you're seeing, but. <laughs> the whole history? Yeah, you can see the whole history. Because I, I don't know if you know this, but um, according to geologists, at one time, there was a huge lake out here called Lake Bonneville. And this lake stretched from Nevada all the way up to Wyoming. And according to the geologists, the lake shrank and shrank and shrank. And the leftover lake today is called the Great Salt Lake. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at, at right where I'm sitting right now, according to these geologists, Lake Bonneville was a mile above my head. I and take it know, that's the Bonneville Salt Flats? Yeah, there you go. The Bonneville Salt Flats. And Lake Bonneville was a huge lake that stretched from you know, three or four states in any direction. Mm -hmm. But now it's the Great Salt Lake. Anyway, so it's fun to hear this guy say, oh, I can see things that most other people can't see. Yeah. And you, I guess you just have to train yourself to say, what what am I seeing and what does it mean? Oh. And from that geologist time period that I used to hang out with geologists, I learned that black sand is often associated with gold. So if you see some black sand on the hillside, stop your car, get out there, start looking for gold. Because <laughs> there's probably gold nearby in the black sand for some odd reason. In the, no. in the de development of geology, black sand and gold are somehow related and they show up at the same spot. Yeah, that's pretty cool. No, if you know enough about certain things, you're always going to see things that other people can't see. Mm -hmm. Driving down the road, if you know all, all about cars, you see unusual vehicles that right, nobody else right, even yeah. thinks about, you know. But that is that is pretty cool. It's, uh, for him to be wandering around there and seeing stuff that whatever that was at the very beginning i'm i'm pretty curious <laughs> what that thing was right I'll there can up. you see yeah. it back can up. you see oh you want to back up yeah Let's see. i'm at 43 seconds so i know where to get back yeah what in the world is that <laughs> a Perfectly spherical kind of ball shows up inside of another big ball. What is this? An egg? Was it an egg at one time? The, this almost looks like a tree to me. Uh -huh. Somehow, I don't know, fell over or something, but who knows? Hopefully, hopefully he'll, he'll uh, refer to this, <laughs> tell us what it is. Yeah, maybe it's just an old geode. Yeah. The geodes we see at the at the tourist traps stores, they're prettier than this. Go ahead. The skills of reading the rocks and seeing things in a different way and enjoy the great outdoors even more. 
Now, the other day I was out here in this very area a couple weeks ago, just hiking, trying to see new areas. And I stumbled upon something that's pretty darn interesting in my view. And so I want to hike over and see that and explore the options as to what we think it is. So let's get started, shall we? Hit pause. <clears throat> so you guys have to know, these guys who make these videos... And all movie makers, right? It's a setup. Because if he's out there by himself, he's got to he's got to walk forward, plant his camera, then walk back. The camera's on, and now he walks forward like it's a spontaneous event, right? <laughs> but he put that <laughs> camera there, yeah. and then walk backwards, and then walk forwards, and it's a lot of work to put these things together to look spontaneous. <laughs> anyway. Go ahead. As I hike along, you know, I'm thinking about enjoying geology as you hike different areas. And that occurred to my wife and me about a week ago. We were at Mount Rushmore. And yeah, the sculptures in the granite there were spectacular. But you know, there was some fascinating geology. And as we hiked along the trail, uh, we were seeing some really beautiful uh, geology. And of course, we were stopping enjoying that right along with the sculptures. While, while all the people, uh, they had no idea what was there. Nobody that I noticed ever even looked and saw it at all. So that's, as I say, a fun part of all this. Well, we're getting close now to this feature. There I sure hope is. you find there it as is. interesting as I did at the time, a couple of weeks ago or whatever it was. Isn't this fascinating? Evidence that of time spirit, travel. It sits underneath. <laughs> and you can see. He was there hole. before, and now he's there again. So this is proof of time travel. Yeah. Where it went. It's like a ball and a hole that it sat in. Let's look around the other side here. Get a three so dimensional. Came first, the ball or the surrounding of the ball? <laughs> I say the ball. Yeah, me too. Oh, I know. This was a, a game of croquet done by giants. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a, a half sphere, isn't it? Interesting texture on it. Now, if we come back and look at that ball a little closer, I find that kind of interesting myself. See what we think. Huh, it's kind of covered in silt. I think I'll clean that off and take a look at it. But it's sure interesting, isn't it? Okay, so I've cleaned off the ball a little just so we can see what's underneath that silt and sand. And it's got a darker look to it, doesn't it? I think it's a darker color than this outer sphere. Uh, so, interesting. At Honda, we've chased down oh, a lot of that things, ancient each one thing. leading to the next, all the way to ancient our Honda. Introducing the all-new, all-electric Honda Prologue. Fascinating, isn't it? You know, I thought it'd be fun to involve my fan base, so I sent out an email to them, those that have subscribed to my newsletter, and asked them to give me some impressions of what it looks like. Don't worry about the geology or anything. Some of them responded with geologic ideas and others not, but it was fun to get the feedback. Let me give you a few examples. <clears throat> Several of them thought it looked like a mushroom. Yeah, it does look like the top of a mushroom. Maybe they're ancient sponges, said uh, someone that goes by cork. Uh, several thought that it was kind of reminded them of a fruit, you know, with a, uh, the pit of like a peach or something. Uh, kid curry, a hip joint. Yeah, you do have kind of a ball and socket feel to that. Um, a brain coral, maybe, uh, says Scott. 
Or maybe Sean, as Sean said, it's a native grindstone that's lying on its side that it was used to grind things with. Was that our Sean? Sean Eagle? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's some kind of a game, said uh, Grandma Mich Michelle. Uh, of course, some of them thought that it could be dinosaur eggs and, and mentioned that, well, it's a little too round maybe to be an egg, but it, it reminds you of that. Uh, maybe an oversized cave pearl, as Mitchell said. Henry and others said it, it reminded them of a giant clam with a pearl inside. Yeah. Some invoked volcanic activity, which is interesting because we do have volca uh, volcanic or volcanoes that were active at the time to the west. So that's fascinating. It could be a volcanic bomb, uh, what they call a bomb, a, a molten blob that flew out and maybe landed in water or something and, and cooled off in a spherical shape. Uh, a fellow by the name of Cap, who I know, hello Cap, he thought, well, maybe it could be uh, just two different fluids of different densities, like a lava lump lamp, excuse me, where you have two densities. And if you, if you have one fluid that's different, it, it can form a sphere floating in that fluid and that maybe something like that could happen. So a lot of fascinating thoughts. It reminds you of a lot of interesting things as far as the shapes and what they potentially could be. So now with that, I'm not going to talk much more about this now. We're going to come back to this and talk to, about this uh, particular feature and others that are around here, but I want to go to a place that's about a hundred miles away that I think is going to help us understand what's going on here, because I think you can relate those to this. So let's go there. Driving along the highway, this outcrop of rocks caught my eye. In particular, I noticed rusty colored rocks scattered about and also protruding from the rock face. Well, these are some interesting, I'll call them blobs, big almost like boulders in this layer of rock. I walked up the dip slope, or the slope of the natural formation that has been folded on the front of the Thermopolis Anticline is the name of it. It's dipping about 18 degrees. I'm within the amazing frontier formation. And I see these big blobs here in this layer about 25 feet down from the top or so. And as a geologist, I'm thinking, could these parts out here be some of this too that is weathered out? Does it only go back into, into this layer of rock just a ways? Or does it go further? Are they all through here? So in my mind, what I'd really like to see is that this layer of rock stripped down, just gently stripped down to reveal a bigger, broader surface to see what these really look like, and can they give us some clues about what we've seen earlier? So I want to look around just a little more as a geologist should, making some observations and continuing to look at this layer and see if we can find an area that's even better, and I have a suspicion we're going to. With the help of the drone, let's get some broader context. Here I am for scale. I'm walking up the nose of a large fold referred to as the Thermopolis Anticline. The sandstones are within the 95 million year old Cretaceous Age frontier formation. Oh, hit pause. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, because this is this video must be three years old, so he should have said 95 million and three years. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Never mind. <laughs> never, never mind the flood. Right. Or the mini floods. Who the hell knows? That looks like sedimentary. The, all the, what the, you know, the strata. Uh -huh. It looks like sedimentary activity from being flooded. Again, going, going back to Mount St. Helens, when that sucker blew back in, I don't know, was it the 90s? I don't know. 80s, I think. It created a mini Grand Canyon. Oh, yeah. In a few days or weeks, yeah. anyway. Anyway, I don't know. I, when I, you know, 
after I learned that there, there was such a thing as Lake Bonneville, a lake that covered three or four states going in any direction, you know, all the way from Wyoming through Utah, Colorado, uh, into New, um, New Mexico and Arizona. Anyway, after I learned that, the next time I flew on a plane from Salt Lake to, to Las Vegas, just looking out the window, you could see the whole area look like the bottom of a lake. Mm -hmm. The way the sand settles, you know, yeah. at the bottom of the lake. And I just thought, oh, yeah, look, I think you see it now. When we look at the Colorado, <clears throat> how the Colorado River dug out the Grand Canyon, you can see the different layers of sedimentation that have taken place over millions of years. You know, there's places in uh, New Mexico, Utah, Arizona, where you can look up on the hill and see the different layers of sedimentary rock that had accumulated at different times. So my grandmother had a gold mine in Leadville, Colorado. Government shut them down because they were controlling gold. But when they were in the process of digging for gold, they found some fossilized eggs. Wow. And they took, they took the eggs to the Museum of Natural History, and they said they were genuine dinosaur eggs. <laughs> But they were found at a level where there was also seashells immediately above them. Mm -hmm. So at some point, the Rocky Mountains had to be down at the bottom of the ocean and then brought back up again. And more, more cosmic dust building up on the earth to cause the, the fossilization over a period of time. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty interesting to see that our, our continent was under the ocean at least once. And the pyramids have sea creatures fossilized into the into the surface. Wow! That's so a, Egypt was underwater at one time too. Wow! Hey, Richard. Hey, how you doing? Doing awesome, man. How are you doing today? Fine, thanks. What are we looking at here? Uh, a couple of geology videos. This is our second one of the day. Kind of nailed in the flood. No, we're not talking about the flood. Just, uh, just regular old geology in uh, Arizona and wherever this guy is. Uh, he's trying to figure out how come these these rocks are round that he found. Oh. Anyway, a little bit off topic because I I just find it interesting. I and like later on, later on. I I think we'll get around to Ephesians chapter one. So. Hang on. If you insist on being spiritual, we'll get there. <laughs> I know we will. Yeah, because there's a fine line between spiritual and self-righteous, and we got to demonstrate our self-righteousness by being spiritual. <laughs> okay, hit play. I hope I didn't lose the sound. Well, that's a good drone camera there. I've drawn these lines to show how the sandstones were once folded some 65 million years ago during the Laramide orogeny. Of course, the top part of this fold has been deeply eroded. The width of the fold shown by the lines is over one and a half miles wide and it extends way off into the distance that we can't really see. It's 26 miles long. <clears throat> Let's follow the sandstone along the flank of the fold and look for better exposures. Hey, I'm in. Walking through this amazing scene, I ponder the history that brought it to view. I hope that you take the opportunities available to you to explore your natural surroundings. Good thing Tommy's not on. 
he'd be calling those Nephilim eggs. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Tommy. That was, I hope you, you took that as a joke as it was meant. Unlock Mountain Dew Game Rewards. Buy Dew. Enter codes. Get rewarded. There's one simple hearing hack anyone can use to get rid of tinnitus in less than 24 hours. You may... Now this is fun, isn't it? We've found the layer where we had these blobs in the outcrop in the side of the hill. We've thought how interesting they may be. We made a few observations there. We want to follow that layer out around the side of the anticline where it's exposed and see if we might find better opportunities to study these spheres or these blobs. And here we are. Boy, have we ever been lucky, haven't we? We've now the top 25 feet or so of the frontier formation has eroded gently down to slowly reveal these spheres which obviously are more resistant to erosion than the sandstone that they're encased in, and hence they're eroded out in this beautiful relief. Now, we've had a lot of ideas about these spheres. We've talked about what they remind us of, the shapes, etc. In fact, I had a local older gentleman stop by just a bit ago, and he was wondering if they were brought in by glaciers. So there you go, another idea. So it's time to get to business. We've made a few observations, but we need to make some more serious ones. So let's walk around, make a few key observations, and then talk about what we really believe, and narrow down our ideas, and come to hopefully an answer that's satisfactory. So let's get started. The first simple thing we can do is make observations about the feel of them, just how they feel to the hand. Uh, just as I expected, it feels rough. I don't know if you'll see it on uh, in video, but I see tiny little sparkles. Those are from feldspar crystals. The faces of them reflect the light. We have the beautiful lichen on the surface, so they like it. And that's because it's a sandstone. I've looked at it with my hand lens, and it, it's a very nice sandstone. So that's an important observation. Let's carry on. Coming up into this area, we see kind of a different surface texture to these spheres. Uh, I see kind of a subtle layering within those, like bedding is what I see. Now, I have some experience with this, so it's a little easier for me to see, but these lines that, that go across these spheres, you see them all through here. They're weathered out in that way. So those are depositional layers within the sandstone that are preserved within the spheres. So uh, another key observation. Most of these are very spherical in nature, although sometimes they do get some irregular shapes. So if I come right over here and take a look, we see one that's kind of a, a longer shape, kind of a tube shaped almost. Short tube, but nevertheless, it's not spherical. And in this area, we see multiple spheres that kind of merge together. If you can see this, <clears throat> yeah, they touch and merge together. I've seen several like that. So they're not always isolated spheres. Another nice example of these spheres that kind of merge together. Sometimes they almost look like dinner rolls that have been baked together. Here is one that has quite a long shape to it. And then right at the very end, up there in the shadows, a nice little round ball at the end. Here's one that is split. Uh, there are not too many of them that are split here. And I've looked inside. I don't see anything unusual inside along that fracture face. Here is a nice half sphere where it has been split pretty much in the middle along here. And again, I don't see anything unusual. I see evidence of layering or bedding within the rock here. But that's about it. Okay, observations and how they affect the way we interpret what we see. First thing, the observation that these are made of sandstone. What does that do to all the various thoughts that we've had about these spheres and odd shaped bodies? Well, in my mind, that means anything fossilized is out. 
because fossils are not made of sandstone. When you look at petrified wood or fossils, whatever type they might be, they're not composed of sandstone. So that takes all the, you know, the corals and sponges, sponges, etc., that we've talked about. Another thing that it obviously removes is this thought that maybe somehow volcanics or volcanism was somehow involved directly. So it's not volcanic rock because again, it's sandstone. Well, this is quickly narrowing things down, isn't it? Just that one simple observation. What about some type of ancient civilization? Hmm. Well, when you look around here, it's really hard to think of a reason why there would be so many of these large spheres made for some purpose by an ancient civilization. So that's really difficult to get your head around. Another one is, as we saw in the prior outcrop, they were embedded in with a, within a layer of rock, which happens to be the frontier formation. And so, boy, that would make it super duper old uh, to take civilization back to them. So we can confidently say it has nothing to do with uh, man-made processes, shall we say. Uh, I might bring up the glaciers somehow transported. What do you think there? You think it through and you go, well, glaciers can round rocks a fair bit. I've never seen them round things to this nature, but maybe the more important thing is large glacial rocks, even if they are getting rounded and polished in some cases, they're very durable. This sandstone actually isn't that durable. And then you have to wonder why all these spheres here and actually glaciers that, there are no documented glaciers that get out here. So, uh, Again, at least as a geologist, you know, with my background as a geologist, that's a pretty simple one to discard for, for those reasons. And there are others. So now we're down to the, the special geologic process. And I know there are many of you out there that already know what, what I'm coming to, don't you? And that is because you're familiar with some of these in some other areas, they're actually fairly common. They're called concretions. Okay, so what? You have a fancy word. Let's talk about how they form. So I'm going to turn to my trusty whiteboard. I've sketched several layers of rock. We've got a cross-sectional view. Here's my fancy little tree here. We have layers of rock that are deposited on top of each other through time. Now, I've mentioned before, but I'll continue to mention this because I've noticed it surprises people, is that as layers of rock are deposited, all this pore space or holes within the rock fill with cement. Cement precipitates within it. Usually it's like uh, silica or quartz, you can think of it, that fill those pores, or calcium carbonate. Those are the two most common. Uh, and so they, they get cemented as they're buried. But this particular process to form concretions is really just an early cementation. So early in the process, we have a layer. These dots represent, represent sandstone. So I have three layers of sandstone. Let's focus on here. I've put a dot here to represent often, not always, but often we see in the middle of these concretions some, some uh, leaf or twig, piece of twig, very small can be, or an animal that cement, it, it provides a seed point for cement to start precipitating around it and growing out radially. Now for it to grow out radially and in a sphere, this uh, sandstone needs to be a really nice homogeneous clean sandstone. Because if it has irregular properties, of course, it's gonna be hard for that cement to grow in such a nice sphere, almost like a crystal. So I've put a dot here to represent that. And we just have, through time, cement just building out in a three-dimensional sphere to create these nice spheres that we see, these concretions. Now, of course, we've noticed irregular shaped ones. In fact, uh, many of you will have seen my video on giant petrified trees that are, in fact, I hate to spoil it here, concretions. So we get these irregular ones, too, and they can be really crazy looking. Let's think about that. How could that be? And that is, not all sandstone is homogeneous, okay? So we can have this layer of sandstone and there can be three-dimensional shapes within it, 
where fluid travels more easily. It has higher permeability. And if that occurs, that means more water laden with minerals is passing through that area, whereas other parts of the sandstone uh, are not as permeable. And so less minerals. So think of that. So you could have a three-dimensional shape, a tube, a log shape, or very common out here, where more fluids pass through, more cement is uh, deposited or precipitated, I should say, within the pores, and you cement this weird shape. Now later, this is early cementation, as you continue to bury, all the sandstone gets uh, cemented to some level. And that's why we see it in outcrops here where you have a pretty good sandstone and within it are these blobs and spheres that are weathering out. And uh, because it's more resistant, even though it's all cemented, this cement, there's more of it, or it may be a different type of cement that is more resistant to erosion. It might be more, have more iron in it, an iron oxide, which is common out here, it gives us this rusty color. I almost always see some more iron in the concretions in, in the Bighorn Basin. So there you go. That's the formation of concretions. I'm continually amazed at the diversity of inspiring scenes that I encounter in nature. Sometimes they are interesting geologic features, and other times it's the vegetation thriving on the high mountain slopes. I think it's pretty clear now that the first feature that we saw is a concretion that has been split in two, giving us this half sphere. Let's go back to this area and explore some more. Well, we've learned a lot about concretions together, haven't we? We've seen oh, some yes. really beautiful concretions. Most of them large spheres, which is kind of fun for this. But I wanted to come back and talk about these the early uh, concretions that I showed you, where you have the ball that's sitting underneath, or within, I should say. And those tend to be darker color. And then the outer part tends to be lighter. And I want you to think for a minute, how is it that you can have that occur in a concretionary uh, situation? And if you think about it a minute, I'm sure you'll come with the same conclusion that I have, or at least I like to think that. And that is that the chemistries of the groundwater change through time. So let's imagine in our heads together for a minute. You have groundwaters that are relatively iron rich, building a concretion within the sandstone. And then at, at some point, let's say the concretion's this size, just for the fun of it, the chemistry of the water changes and it doesn't have as much iron. But the concretionary process continues. So it builds an outer larger sphere that has less iron in it and more calcium carbonate type cement that is growing and creating this concretion. That's a fairly simple scenario, and I think it's the most likely one. So now that your eyes are tuned into these spheres and some of the characteristics of them, you can see them easily, can't you? We've got a sphere within a sphere here, beautifully eroded one. I like this one. Well, this is a fun area. See some half spheres, some sitting in the in the ground somewhat. Uh, here's a nice half sphere here. And if you look, you see an outer rind with a, a ball in the middle. This one's pretty big. That's uh, easily a foot across. As we've learned, concretions are not always spherically shaped. This one certainly has an interesting look to it. And notice that the interior portion of it is quite large. Well, Mother Nature seems to provide a lot of variability. In this particular one, the interior seems to be less resistant to weathering. Hanging on to the sandstone ledge, this one will soon split in two. So with that, uh, that's the end of this video, and I hope you've enjoyed it. And more importantly, I hope it motivates you, for those that can anyway, to get out, explore your surroundings, and imagine what might be occurring around you. It doesn't matter if you're wrong. It's just fun. The process is fun, and you can think about the bigger world around you. Thank you for watching. That was fun.
Yeah. My immediate comment is there are reasons why. Yeah. It's not random. There are reasons why. The law of cause and effect. Yeah. Just because you don't know the reasons why doesn't mean that there are no reasons why. Right. And if a fella, you know, you can't say a fella has a free will. He's got a will. And if he, if he loves 1957 Chevys <laughs> and he buys them and restores them, there are reasons why. You know, in my study of, uh, of health and nutrition, I think it's even evident there that some people have behaviors based on their the internal stuff going on in their guts, you know. Uh, a lack of niacin or uh, the inability of the body to uptake vitamin B vitamins when you have too much alcohol. And so because you don't have an uptake of B vitamins, you are depressed. Sure. And and then you come along and see a depressed fellow and you say, oh, he's depressed of his own free will. What? <laughs> he's going to hell because he's a depressed fellow. <laughs> or he's a, afraid. There was an argument just a month or two ago between... Eric's crew and Bruce's crew because Bruce said that he's got agoraphobia and Eric said all those who are fearful are going to be put outside the gate and <laughs> that means you, you'll go to hell because you're fearful wow so why is Bruce fearful probably has to do with his body chemistry that could be adjusted or tuned up with say less Candy bars? I mean, something simple. <laughs> but yeah, there are reasons why. And, um, and it's a fun journey to start down the road of saying, hey, what, what, what's going on here? Why are these balls sitting in the middle of the desert? <laughs> Giants were playing golf? What? The little balls were made so Israel could stone their people based on violations of the law. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> they're easier to, to hold when they're small and round. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Are you done with your class today, Richard? Yeah. What'd you teach on? Uh, ever usage of Eonium. Really? Yeah. yeah. It's finished for God's Purpose and Creation course. Uh-huh. Well, that's a thing. Yeah. That's 199 verses that you went over. Today, or was it a series? Uh, the last two sessions, I went through every usage of Aeon, Aeon and today was Eonian. Uh -huh. so I couldn't do it all in one. Too many. <laughs> but it's amazing to see even Strong's translate that as um, a span of time. <laughs> it says, right in Strong's. Uh -huh. mm. A span of time, an age. A couple of weeks then ago on this channel, <clears throat> uh, that new kid, uh, Justin, he went through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, looking uh -huh. for the word aeon in the plural. Yeah. And he, he was shocked that, and, and enlightened that Jesus never used the word aeon in the plural. Yeah. Isn't that something? He talked about this eon, the conclusion of this eon, the next eon, the eon to come. Right, but he didn't mention the eons, plural. Nope. We have to wait till Paul to get that information. Yep. Go ahead, Dale. 
I was just thinking Strong's probably for definition number two has eternal. Yeah. Yeah, for the plural. That age is rolling on ages, which adds a word to God's word. Rolling isn't there, and on isn't there. <laughs> well, they just add to God's word as Eve did, you know. Neither shall you touch it. <clears throat> Mr. Wildheart, say hello to Richard. Hello, Richard. Hello, Wildheart. How's it going? Hello, Wild Art. Hi, man. What's it? So, Wild Heart just woke up. He was uh, taking a long nap, and now he's here to join us, to ready to rock and roll. Yeah. Ten, ten to five uh, in the evening, afternoon. Yeah, a long, long nap. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you in England, Wild Heart? Uh, Manchester. <laughs> oh, you are <laughs> no uh, Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people I from Manchester. Go grab coffee. Did you want to go? People from Manchester and people from Liverpool don't get on. So I know this one's milk by saying that I'm from Liverpool. No, it's <laughs> Manchester. <laughs> My wife is back over there. She's in between Thetford and North. Oh yeah. We made it to Ephesians 1. Yay. Now we can be spiritual. <laughs> so what was that? I, I caught the, the tail end of that video. He was talking about white rocks or something. Yeah, hang on just a second. Well, uh, Greg, are you still here? No. <clears throat> okay, when uh, when Greg gets back, you guys, tell him that he's in charge. He can remove my uh, screen and put up his own screen. If you guys want to read Ephesians while I'm gone, I'll be gone for about half hour, 45 minutes. Behave yourself. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I shall. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to read it, but. Yeah, I get what I mean. Yeah, I would need to be here to scroll it up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you've got your Bible there. You can read it out loud. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Take over, you guys. All right. Good to see you. And tune up anybody from Liverpool that you see. <laughs> <laughs> no need, S. No need. You know. Yes, I am all about it. Uh, unless someone else wants to do it, I don't know. If he uses hey, that, Richard, he I, was, I was on a phone call and don't know where the show is at this time. Have we started the Ephesians yet? You're no, right. it's, you're in it's, charge, it's, Greg. Yeah, you're in charge. Um, yeah. Uh, I think he said turn, turn his camera off or something as well. He said, Ace said he's got to be gone for about a half hour or so. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. I was just on, on a phone call with Tony Nungesser, and I wasn't able to pay attention to the show, and I was waiting for him to get to where we were going to start doing scripture. So. <clears throat> yeah, he had uh, Ephesians up. Uh, Greg, if, if you can like show your screen and put Ephesians up. I think he wants someone to read it. Oh, oh. I, it's one of my favorite verses in the whole scriptures. Did Ace leave his uh, his, <coughs> yeah. his, his screen share on for you to yeah. put up if you want? Okay. However, I don't think I can, I can't scroll it. All oh, I can do is display what he has. Mm. But I've got a concordant version, Andy. 
Yeah, that was me. Oh, shit. I think it's wonderful the way Paul opens the Ephesians letter. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus through the will of God to all the saints who are also believers in Christ Jesus. I mean, that's pretty clear. It's to everybody who believes in the ascended Christ, not limited to just those in this, this, this ecclesia or another ecclesia, but to all who believe in the ascended Christ. And that's a message that isn't taught in the churches today. The ascended Christ isn't even mentioned unless it's him just going off on the clouds and acts. As far as churches are concerned, he's never done anything for 2,000 years. <laughs> Doesn't, doesn't all Paul's letters start the same? Have I got that right? With the same kind of intro, the first couple of lines are always the same. Um, well, actually, all of his other ones aren't quite as general as this one is. Um, um, I mean, he doesn't he he doesn't come at, come right out and and say it to anyone that's believing in Christ Jesus, except in this letter. I think it would be uh, a, be a Philippians yeah. and Colossians would be the other. The other ones that had it, because those are the prison epistles, and they were written strictly to the nations without Israel being in the middle. Let's see. Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. That's Philippians. And Colossians, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, through the will of God, and Bremer Timothy, to the saints in Blurt, and believing brethren in Christ in Coloss. So a Colossians letter was was written directly to the Colossians with us in mind. And Ephesians and Philippians are being addressed directly to us. When you get into Romans and the other letters, it's it's a little a little more specific. Although they're all written to the nations as he tells us in those letters. But you know you read Hebrews, Hebrews is written to the Hebrews. James yeah. was written to the twelve tribes of the dispersion. The address is quite specific. Yeah, and Peter's addressed to the dispersion as well. Yeah. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blesses us with every spiritual blessing among the celestials in Christ. You know, good way to good way to reference this is if God was blessing us with every terrestrial blessing on the earth, what would we have? We'd have money. We'd have the best cars, the nicest houses, the fastest boats, the best liquor, the prettiest girl. We'd have our own nation too. Yeah, probably so. But uh, he doesn't. He doesn't bless us with terrestrial blessings. He tells us to put those off from us, to get away from those and put on the spiritual. So the spiritual blessings, when, we, when we're already receiving some of them, a little taste of them, and, and as, if from what I see, these are the attributes of God, kindness, patience, meekness, love, self-control, the things that are going to be tools that we use in the celestials to be reconciling these other, <clears throat> other beings back into the Father. Um, so our celestial blessings are going to be the best that we can possibly have in the celestials because we're going to be Christ's body and he is set as head over all. So we're going to share in that same title with him as being head over all in the celestials, to the celestials. And this is why in Ephesians 3.10, Paul says that the, the sovereignties and the authority, well, let's go ahead and read it, 8 through 10. So beautiful. To me, less than least of all the saints is granted this grace to bring the evangel of the intraceable riches of Christ to the nations and enlighten all as to what is the administration of the secret, which has been concealed from the eons and God who creates all that now it may be made known to the sovereignties and the authorities among the celestials through the ecclesia of the multifarious wisdom of God in accord with the purpose of the eons, which we see in Ephesians 1, 9 and 10 which he makes in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
So here the sovereignties and the authorities among the celestials are learning about what the truth of God is through us. God is bringing his truth through his spirit in us in a little tiny, just a little tiny foretaste, just a, a, enough for us to, to realize who he is and see the glory of his truth. And we are teaching the sovereignties and the authorities as our revelations become apparent to us and we come on H. Theo and start talking about these truths. The sovereignties and authorities are listening because they've never had any oracle of truth to tell them what was going on before. The heavens and the earth were created, and that's all they knew. They were aligned with this or they were aligned with that. They had this rank or that authority, but they didn't know the purpose, the intent, or the reasoning for it. Now, all of a sudden, these, these humans on this earth are starting to talk about things that sound like answers to questions they've always had. So they tune in. They want to hear it. They want to see what's going on because they can see that we're the ones that apparently God is showing it through. So it's, it's quite a blessing for, for myself to see that we're not alone. We're on display all the time. We think we're alone hiding in the darkness of our rooms or, or whatever, but we're being seen by more than we care to care to even think about. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I apologize in advance. <coughs> But like if, if, if the government like put cameras in your home and we're watching you 24 seven, I think like most people would kind of, you know, get quite upset about that and they would call it an outrage. And how come when, when God does the same thing, that that's, that's a good thing. Well, um, have you, have you heard that the government is watching us through our telephones or televisions through yeah. appliances now that have cameras in them? And they, yeah, can that, on and they can watch you 24 hours a day. That's what I mean. And people get quite upset about it. I'm just wondering why they get upset about the government doing it, but don't get upset about God doing the same, exactly the same thing. Well, they, they could get upset about it, but it's not going to hide. It's not going to hide them. They're oh, yeah. being upset. isn't going to change anything. Yeah. But, but I'm asking why get obsessed about one and not get obsessed about someone doing the exact same thing. Well, I'm, I guess I don't understand your question. I'm sorry, David. Yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, I often have that problem. <laughs> I, I mean, why would people get obsessed about the government doing it? Oh, the government doing it. That's just it. They, yeah. they, are, they don't seem to be upset. They still have the same number of TVs. They're still yeah. buying phones and carrying them around with them. We've got a, a webcam on every one of our tables that's sitting there watching us eat our dinner or, or do whatever else we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So we we even though we may in our in our minds be upset that we know we're being watched, we don't pay enough attention to it to hide our phones and cover our TVs and make sure our appliances don't have a camera in it. So, but, uh, remember when Bill Clinton and the attorney general met in an airplane at an airport and had a conversation and everyone was wondering what was going on? Well, a transcript was released of their conversation and it was asked, how did you get this transcript? And they had to admit if the FAA has a microphone, has microphones on every aircraft and record every conversation. So they That's just one. they just yeah. let this one out for the public, but it exposed that every airplane's got the same listening devices that your television, your telephone, your webcam has in it. So we're we're on display, and when we see what happens in China, uh, China, you have to have your phone on you, and it has to be charged. That's just a law, because at yeah. any time they want to see what you're doing and who you're talking to. They want to they want to stay in charge of everything. And they've been bulletproofing their AI system now for probably over 15 years. And I, I saw a video the other day where the Chinese police now have these sunglasses that they put on. And when they put it on, everyone they see, it draws a square around their face and recognizes them and then shows you all the details of what they've got going on. And if there's a red square around the face, they've got to gra grab that person and find out why they're not in the database and get all of their information. So this yeah. this is a, this is this is this is the control I think we're about to see happen in the rest of the world. I think we're going to get watch, watching me. <laughs> yeah, me too. 
But Elon Musk said the, the strongest AI is going to win, and it's not going to be very long before we see who that is. I think China's been bulletproofing their AI for so long, that's probably going to be the one that takes over the computer industries. You all know what singularity means in terms of yep. AI? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we'll keep that because if you look at the releases Microsoft's making of Chat GPT, GPT 4, 5, they're releasing a video editing tool where you can create videos just with text. And, uh, but they're not releasing it till later this year, but they've had it for 18 months already. So when they say we haven't reached singularity yet, I think they have. There's a, a leaks coming out from Microsoft, and one of them says that uh, they have achieved that. And what that means to people who don't know is that there's a bunch of AI that can do specific things like give you copy for books that can uh, analyze spreadsheets, do this and that. But those are all independent. Um, when they get a brain that uses all those other AIs, that's singularity. Oh, okay. And um, they have achieved that because this uh, brain that they've made has even figured out how to unencrypt any encryption man has made on its own. Yeah, I, I heard that. And I heard that uh, Google released their fifth generation AI a few weeks ago and people were, were real thrilled to see it. And they said, let's see it work. So one guy said, show me a picture of George Washington. And when it drew a picture of George Washington, he was black. Yeah, <laughs> so they had to pull it. Yeah, they had but, to pull it. Well, we got to tweak this. We evidently had a woke programmer. <laughs> yeah. But the thing with the encryption is uh, if that gets leaked out, that that uh, brain, yeah. it's over because yeah. markets, will, there's no account that's safe. Right. If, if the uh, AI says it wants to drain everybody's bank account, it will. If it wants no, to show... No. I think safety and security is an illusion anyway. I think they've yeah. been going in, into our uh, computers, into our phone calls. My son works for the company that developed data mining. You know what data mining is, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, he works for the company that installs that system on in all the different countries and all the different companies. All of your banks, all of your cable companies, and the government agencies, they all use this software to record the phone calls coming in. And you uh -huh. can tell, you can query these databases. You can say, show me every phone call that has the word rifle in it. And it'll right. pull out every communication that had the word rifle in it. Well, he yeah. calls me up one day. He says, I'm going to be gone for a couple of weeks. I've got to go to London. I said, what's going on in London? He said, we've got a new upgrade to our software and the queen is going to be the first one to get it. I said, what's the new upgrade? He said, we can now detect emotions. We can tell if the people are happy or angry or sad. And yeah. I said, damn, damn, John, just think of how many people are going to die now because of that upgrade. He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, if your software will already pull out a word that somebody somebody's using, what if now that you can detect emotions, you say, everyone that mentioned the queen that was mad, I want every phone call. Yeah. And you can pull out everyone who was angry with the queen and go drive to their house and arrest them. He said, yeah. we wouldn't sell it to yeah. a country. We wouldn't sell it to a country that would do that. I said, well, what if you sold it to a country that was taken over by somebody that could do that? He said, shut up. I don't, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in England, that wouldn't work on a practical level because basically everyone hates the royal family. Or most people hate the royal family. So, yeah, if you have a phone call of someone being angry and talking about the Queen, that would, yeah, like 90% of the people would be locked up. <laughs> just on a practical level <laughs> that's that's normal that's normal conversation huh yeah. Yeah. all phone calls are recorded all of them they have yeah. been for decades they just didn't tell anybody about it they want you to think you're free to talk on your local phone conversations but it's all recorded and when they decide they're going to clamp down on everybody they have all the evidence they need to go do what they need to do it's like Zuckerberg. One night he turned Facebook public. All private things that were private, he made them public, took a snapshot of Facebook, and then turned them back private again and sold that snapshot to China. Now, China can do facial recognition on everybody that's on Facebook. Wow. Why would he do that? Money. 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 Money, Money honey. 
Lust for money is the root of all evil. Yeah, they're not happy that they're already billionaires. They got to get more. Well, that's like what's his name? Jacob Jacob Rothschild just died, and he had a, a personal wealth of over seven hundred trillion dollars. What do you do with that money? It would just take a pinch off of that pile to settle all the world's debt. Yeah. It's more about power than money, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. But money, when I was in um, sociology class, they said for, for men, the three things to go for is wealth, prestige, and power. But wealth will buy prestige and power. So wealth is the number one thing to go for. There you yeah. go. That's how I should have said it. The wealth leads to the power. Yeah. yeah. Well, now we know why women act the way they do. Hello, <laughs> oh, hopefully he doesn't get a flag. <laughs> hey, <my dear. laughs> well, they like the money. It gives them the power. Or they have the power to get the money, whichever way you want to say it. Well, I think AI is the, the be all and do all. Wait till they meet the uh, real intelligence, not the artificial, yeah. the real intelligence of the universe. <laughs> yeah, just the word AI, just, just what it means. Artificial intelligence should tell you everything. Yeah. Hey, Tommy. Hey, Deborah. Hey, Peter. <laughs> I got to highlight that. That's cute. <laughs> so I saw you on for a few minutes this morning, Richard. And I had company. I had to take care of things. Oh, yeah. Going through the Eonian verses. Very good. In Christ, according as he chooses us in him before the disruption of the world. I love that, that scripture in 1 Corinthians 1, 24 through 29. It says God chooses everything so that no flesh at all can be boasting in his sight that they can be choosing anything. <laughs> it's a silver bullet to the free will crowd. Yeah. It is interesting how somehow they think they can make a quote unquote free choice out of a will that they admit is not free. Right. Full of contradictions. That's like that's like drawing sweet water from a bitter well. What? How do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> Even science knows there's no free will. A lot of videos on, on YouTube. I think the biggest thing that proves free will doesn't exist is the fact God doesn't have free will. Jesus no. doesn't have free will. So why would mankind think he has free will? Because it looks like we do. Because we yeah. feels like it, we do. Yeah. It looks and feels like we do, sure. Yeah. They can't separate the absolute from the relative is why. Yes. Yeah. Well, they've never been, been told what the absolute means. And they've mm -hmm. only been living in the relative. Deborah, I think the name of Richard's channel is Faith Igniter. Isn't that right, Richard? Yeah, that's right. With an O-R, Ignitor. Ignitor. She was wondering what your channel name was. I think she's going to subscribe to you. Yeah. Lots of good stuff God's taught me there. Yeah. It's 
So what do you all think about the eclipse that's coming up on the 8th? I can't wait. I can't wait. Video? Yeah, I've seen quite a few. I think it's real interesting that this comet has always been called the Devil's Comet. And now it's coming back around during an eclipse. Yeah. But they say yeah. that we can't see the comet because it's a daytime comet, which means it's on the sun side of the Earth. If it's on the sun side of the Earth, when the eclipse happens, we should be able to see it. Oh. If it was on the dark side of the Earth, we'd see it at night. Right. But I saw a video in 2017, and it went from uh, northwest to southeast. Right. And this one from the other direction, and it forms an X over the country. Exactly. And the, the spot where they cross is the New Madrid Fault. So Very a lot cool. of people, if, if that would split the U.S. in half from north to south. With may, much destruction. Yeah. yeah. Well, I saw a video um, yesterday. I think it was yesterday. Said that World War One began during an eclipse. World That's War right. Two began during an eclipse, and they're yeah. expecting World War Three to begin during this eclipse. God uses those signs, those uh, celestial events, as signs. Calendar. Some we don't always know what the sign means, but they seem related to judgment. Uh, mm -hmm. the eclipses and like I World War One, or Two, World War Three, maybe coming up here. And the I fact that there's apart, you know, sorry, the, the 17 and 2024, seven years apart is significant, and they're both oh, over the good. UN. <laughs> good point. Good point. So, I think every major uh, faith based um, religions see comets as harbingers of doom. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see it. And, and the events don't have to happen the same day as the eclipse. They happen sometime after, a few months. So it's, it's more like a warning, and then the event happens a little while later. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, being a harbinger means beware. <laughs> something, yeah. something wicked this way comes. But you know, it, it's really good news because it just means that we're getting closer and closer to the man of lawlessness being revealed, and yeah. we get to, we're going to be out of here before that happens. Yeah, you read a verse about the principalities, powers, mights, and dominions in Ephesians there, and I was talking to a friend yesterday, and he was saying how bad the world's getting, and who do you think's in control of all this? And I said, well, the devil is the god of this eon, but God's in ultimate control. Yeah, God's the one that's in control of Satan. That's right. And the principalities, powers, mights, and dominions are running this world. Yeah, don't tell Tommy that. <laughs> <laughs> He's a little all sensitive come like the lgbtq trend all that is spiritually inspired well i was thinking of something last night when they first started up cern they found out that an unexpected byproduct of cern was antimatter and they yeah. were trapping the antimatter in magnetic bottles and when they had enough of it trapped they gave it to a university to study and immediately <coughs> <clears throat> the crime the crime on the campus escalated. The rapes and the fights and the murders just exploded. And they were really? it was going to be the antimatter causing it. So they were going to move the antimatter to an underground vault where it couldn't no. affect anybody. But CERN continues to run. So they're continuing to get antimatter. Do you think maybe this antimatter is what's causing the evilness to increase? No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Antimatter is just like a particle that just annihilates matter. <laughs> there's, there's no possible connection between antimatter and people committing evil. It's just a physics thing. It doesn't control human behavior. There's well, no I wasn't possible saying controlling human behavior, but presenting an environment where evil can flourish. No, no, it's just a physics thing. If you have antimatter, it annihilates matter. That, that's all it does. 
that's, yeah, that's now it. they're just saying there it doesn't actually exist. Now they're saying that. So well, yeah, I would expect him to say that if it did exist and was having such a negative effect. But I thought it was funny when CERN came out. We had uh, evangelists saying, "Oh, this is terrible! It's going to open doors so demons come in." And I thought, if they only knew, demons are already here. <laughs> Yeah, all they have to do is go to their local church and they'll hear the teaching of demons. <laughs> they say some crazy things, don't they? Yes, they do. So opening a portal to demons. Oh, really? Well, they keep making it stronger and stronger, so they must be wanting that portal to get bigger and bigger. Yeah. And Revelations talks about the keys to the submerged chaos and locking the submerged chaos. Yeah. yeah. Bottomless pit. Yeah. But every knee will bow and every tongue acclaim Jesus is Lord. Those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth. Yeah. <laughs> Leaves no being out. That's right. Reconciliation of all. That's that certifies it. Yeah. God didn't start something he can't finish. <laughs> no. <clears throat> I didn't say I believed it, Pope. I said I, I heard it and said that it was a possibility if it was true. And, yeah, I do believe a lot of things to be true. Most of them are in the scriptures. So. so, Richard, um, I I was talking to Ace and on the other night, and it does seem like most of the churches today have one thread in common. And that's that they teach that the final act of salvation is in the hands of the sinner. Yeah. I thought that God was in charge of salvation. Yes. Christ saved all mankind. But, but the churches yes. don't want their membership to know that. Because if the membership believed that they were already saved 2,000 years ago, why would they come back to church to hear about an angry God that was going to punish them after death? Right. Pretty soon they would stop coming to church to listen to the terror teachings and they wouldn't bring their oh. most precious love offering to appease the angry God that's being promoted to them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, I get you know, yeah. So so you're saying God is in charge of salvation, but Christians quote yeah. unquote Christians, Christians try to hide that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, no. so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's five verses that certify that God accepted his son's sacrifice for the, for the sake of all mankind. And all five of these verses are taboo in the church. They may bring up one, Philippians 2, 11, uh, uh, 9 through 11, where every knee bows and every tongue acclaims, but they don't go into detail on what that means. They're just saying one day everybody's going to be given glory to God through Christ, but they don't mention that it's the evangel of the ascended Christ. They don't mention the ascended Christ at all, except he floated away on the clouds on Acts 9. <clears throat> uh, Philippians is if it's a forced confession, which would be a far fraudulent confession, which would not yeah. glorify God. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, what, what glory is there in bowing a knee if someone has to break your leg to get your knee to the ground? Under extreme duress. Yeah. Yeah. Put a knife to your throat and say, you better say it or else. The glory of God is he can change every heart in an instant. <laughs> and that's what he's doing a little at a time. Yeah. Who knows he changed mine. Yeah. I thought a good show that Ace might want to do sometime is the myths of Christianity. That would be more than one show. <laughs> yeah. That would take like 2,000 years, you know. 
all men. <laughs> From the God man to uh, eternal conscious torment to all sorts of stuff. Water baptism. Yep. Trinity, you know, the unity of Christ. Yeah, most of them are not actually teaching eternal conscious torment now, but they they hold it as a doctrine, but you won't hear it taught much because it turns people up. But they won't change their position. <laughs> the unspoken threat. Yeah. Every time a, an opposer comes in, the show is about their myths. Yeah. 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 Now, Linda Edmondson, <clears throat> she was saying, Ace is the head of a cult, and he's leading all those people to hell. When they're down in hell, they're going to be mad at him for dragging them to hell with him. <laughs> oh, like that. Oh, that's funny. So Ace, the universalist who thinks everyone get, gets into heaven, is dragging people to hell. <laughs> I'm not sure how that works. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it does, that's very, that's very clever. But yeah, I don't. Know. <laughs> dragging, dragging people to a mythological torture chamber. I'm sorry, <laughs> eternal torture chamber. Yep. <laughs> that goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. Their crimes so, were so bad they'll never stop being tortured. So the devil's works are never destroyed, which Jesus Christ came to do, which means he's a failure. That's right. All right. The church is teaching that there's a final act of salvation that they have to do. It's saying Jesus' sacrifice is a failure. Because if you've got to do something else, why did he have to die? Yeah. There's no second chance, as if there was a first chance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, when you read Romans 3, I mean, it's it's stated just as a declaration. Now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. That's a declaration. That's it's a not an image. Yeah. <laughs> and God being the Savior of all mankind, especially of believers, is a declaration. Yeah. The fact that all that were in Adam died and consequently will be made alive in Christ beyond the reach of death is a declaration. Yeah. In Ephesians 2.13, the blood, the um, yet now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off or now near by the blood of Christ is a declaration. So all five of those verses that certify that God accepted his son's sacrifice are all a declaration to mankind that it's a done deal. The film is in the can. There's nothing that is going to change it. Romans 5, by one man, we're all condemned. By one man, we'll all be justified. Yep. <clears throat> I was talking to Tony the other day, and I asked him, I said, don't these preachers see these verses? Don't they know what they mean? He said, no. They, when, they were, when they were taught, they, didn't, they weren't taught what those verses meant. They were taught what they were supposed to teach. Well, if there's they don't teach what they're supposed to teach, they won't be teaching anymore. There's a cognitive dissonance that goes on, because I've, I've confronted several on 1 Timothy 4.10, and they all insist that he made... God made salvation available to all, and that's what it's talking about. But it doesn't say he made it available to all. Because God is the Savior of all mankind. Especially believers is what certifies that, because that means the believers are going to get something that the unbelievers are not going to get. Especially The unbelievers are going to get salvation, but the believers are going to get heaven. Yeah. So everyone's going to be saved, but not everyone's going to heaven. And that's the rub of Christianity, because Christianity says only those who are saved are going to heaven, which is true. But those who are not in heaven are also saved. They don't know that. Well, they, they take that word malasta uh, especially and say it means uh, specifically or something like that. But I looked up where that word's used. It's used two other times. It's used in Galatians, where Paul says we should be especially kind to all men especially the, unto the household of faith. Right. So the especially part is a subset of the whole. 
He uses it when he says, bring me the scrolls in Timothy, but especially the parchments. The vellum, the vellum too. Yeah. And good point. Uh, good point. it's always a subset of the whole. So why would it be different in 1 Timothy 4.10? Only because of their theology. Right. So they got to change God's word. And you got to change the meaning of death to accommodate any kind of life after death without resurrection. And that's what they do. So they change the meaning of the word to accommodate their theology. Right. But then you have nothing but contradictions in the words with the verses that you mentioned. And I mentioned this morning contradict those other verses. So there's a problem with that interpretation. The word's got to fit. Scripture right. can't be broken. Well, they, they, they can't really change 1 Timothy 2, 4 much. For God wills that all mankind be saved and come into a realization of the truth. And they say, oh, my scripture says he just desires it. That doesn't mean it's going to happen. So yeah. why don't you go ahead and look at Isaiah 46, 10 that says, all of my desires shall I fulfill and all of my counsels shall I do. Now what's your argument? Yeah, it says twice it uses that in the Septuagint. He will accomplish all his desire. Yeah. And the other thing about that is uh, that the Lima word is for will is used in Ephesians. God orders all things out of the counsel of his own Thelema. Yeah. I like in that verse where it where all is used with the definite article top on top, which means yeah. everything without question or exception is operated according to the counsel of God's will. The all. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's where I where I get in trouble with a lot of people because I am as Ben Ben labeled me an absolute determinist. And I believe that. I believe everything is determined to be exactly what it is because God had to create it for it to be here. So he yeah. must have determined what it was going to be before he created every molecule, every thought, every second, every moment of his creation has to be a part of his plan. I'm with you, Greg. Thank you, Dale said uh, God has to know where every speck of dust is in the universe at any point in time. Yeah, and all the he, life that is in every drop of the ocean. He can't uh, leave it up to chance in completing his plan. <laughs> no. It gets deep. I mean, that means there is no, no such thing as luck. There is no such thing as chance. Well, that's that's something that Tommy brought up, and I had to really think about it. <clears throat> it says in Ephesians that we were chosen by lot. You know, and, and lotteries are to be fair to all. But in the absolute sense, God knew who exactly was bodies of Christ were going to be because the potter designed them to be thus. Yeah. He determined each person's lot. <laughs> right. Exactly. There you go. Well, it's been fun, guys. But well, I've I've got to bail. Uh, tell us. Uh, thanks a lot when he gets back. Uh, cheers, Greg, Dale, and uh, Richard. Good to see, see you, you all. <laughs> cheers. Right. See you later, David. Have a good day. Love you, brother. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Now there's a success story for Ace. Yeah. <laughs> resident atheist is starting to believe. <laughs> I think it'll be a little harder journey for the preterist. Oh, yeah. His mind is made up right now. Well, I should be able to get on with things here, too. So good to see you all this morning. All right, Richard. It's good to see you, too. Uh, I'll try and catch more of the show next time. All you're, right. You're, kill, oh. you're, you're killing me, Richard. Why? <laughs> hey, getting me stuck here with me. <laughs> oh. No, you're stuck with me. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, I've, I have very little to say. And if if it's just two of us, Oh man, we're going to be sit we're going to be sitting here listening to each other's silence. <laughs> yeah, we might need to find some video to play or something. There you go.
and unless you've got plenty to say because I, I, I really, really don't I, really I really don't have much anything to say unless there's some subject matter that that relates to something I'm not as good at ace at just pulling stuff out of my hat <laughs> But maybe he'll come back with something in his hat he can pull out. <laughs> there you go. Let's see. I was going to see if there's a... I heard that Scott Hicko put out a really good video yesterday. Let's see if yeah, that, that might be fun to listen to. All righty, let me pull it up. Um, so I'm going to do a video, one more video, just talking about the completeness of grace that we live in and that is ours in Christ Jesus. I got a comment in one of my other videos from the last video, I believe, about someone that said something that you had to walk worthily to maintain grace. And I don't know who said it, and I'm not going to repeat the comment because I'm not sure um, that person wants me to um, repeat it. But the person quoted someone in the body of Christ he looks frozen on oh, something to this effect. I don't know if it's word for word, but that our sins are covered by grace as long as we're walking worthily and remaining qualified, then the grace covers everything. And this is a teaching that is very similar, if not exactly, what Christians teach. And I just want to go through a few verses here that completely disprove this comment or this idea in that there's nothing you can do at any level to get grace or maintain grace or something that you do something that you do to make sure that grace covers everything there's nothing you can do and the minute you claim that there is something you can do you are denying what grace is and the power that that grace produces. So I just want to go over a few scriptures talking on that, and then I'm going to move on from this topic. So if we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, this is Paul. For our boasting is in this. So this is what we boast in. The testimony of our conscience that in holiness and sincerity of God, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we behaved ourselves in the world. Okay, so how do we behave ourselves in the world? Dale, it's I don't know how to get from God. It's in the grace of God. So Can in you... the grace of God. We behave ourselves in the world. Can you can you pause it? I couldn't, I couldn't hear what you were saying. Or I couldn't get off the screen where I authorize it to go. I couldn't get back if somebody else wanted to come in. I couldn't get out of it. So I I just hit something which demaximized it. <clears throat> so I was just trying to say I don't know how to get back. Do you know how to get back? And I finally just minimized it, and I, got, I was able to get back out. Well, at the top, just above, just above what you're seeing, there should be a, I think it's a green tab that says to go back to StreamYard. Oh, yeah. Okay. View tab and StreamYard. Okay. I see it. Okay. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll maximize this and go ahead with it then. Or, there you, go. you know, stopping sinning or remaining qualified begins in grace and then grace is the driving force behind us walking worthily remaining qualified 
not sinning certain sins. It starts in grace, and then everything else is a result of grace. It doesn't out. It doesn't start or exist anywhere. The walking worthily, or the not sinning, or the remaining qualif remaining qualified does not exist anywhere outside of it being in the grace of God. So it all starts in grace. So anything you do on your own cannot get into that grace or maintain the grace because the grace is the driving force behind you even walking worthily or not sinning or remaining qualified. If that makes sense. And I, I'll go into that a little bit more here in a moment. 2 Timothy 2.26 says that it is God. Let me go to that. Verse 26, God may be giving them repentance to come into a realization of the truth. So we're given repentance based on our old comprehension, what we used to think. And God causes us to change our mind to come to a realization of the truth. He doesn't cause us to act a certain way or walk worthily or do any of these things to come into a realization of the truth that comes later after we come into a realization of the truth. So it's God that does it all. It all begins in grace. So in grace, we behave ourselves and do good works and we walk worthily. So how can we behave ourselves, do good works and walk worthily in order to receive or maintain grace. That's putting the cart before the horse. In essence, if you're if you're making this comment that you have to walk worthily or remain qualified in order for grace to cover everything, then what you're saying is you can walk worthily, do good works, and behave yourself without grace. That's what you're saying. If you're saying that you have to do certain things to get grace to cover everything, then what you are saying is that in order to get that grace, so you don't have that grace, unless you walk worthily, behave yourself. And what is that? Remain qualified in yourself. That's the flesh. No matter how you sugarcoat it, if you have to do something to get or maintain that grace, you are walking in flesh. And that's exactly what you're doing because you're saying, in essence, that you don't have that grace because you're saying you have to walk worthily, remain qualified, or not commit certain sins in order to get that grace. But scripture says the way you walk worthily, remain qualified, do good works, is in the grace, in the grace of God, is the only way you can walk worthily. So walking worthily outside of the grace of God in order to get or maintain that grace of God is a false teaching. No matter how you want to sugarcoat it, you're going back to law. And you could say all you want, oh, this isn't law. It is law. If you're doing something in the flesh, which you have to be doing it in the flesh, if you're walking worthily in order to get or maintain or cause the grace to cover everything, then you are doing it outside of grace, which is the very definition of the flesh. And you're doing it in order to get that grace or maintain that grace or remain qualified somehow. That's not the way grace works. It's in grace. We have that. That's how we behaved ourselves in the world. We don't walk worthily, remain qualified, behave ourselves in this world outside of that grace. So the grace has to be there in order for us to do those things. It's the grace that produces the walking worthily. It's the grace that produces the good works. It's the grace that produces us turning from certain sins. So to make this comment, our sins are covered by grace as long as we're walking worthily and remaining qualified, then grace covers everything. That means you're doing that outside of grace in order to get that grace. That means you're doing it in flesh. And that is something that Paul never teaches anywhere. Yeah, in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul talks about being disqualified. 
He does say that in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But if you read the context, Paul is talking about being disqualified from being effective in sharing the evangel. That's what that whole chapter in that letter is about. Paul becoming certain things to other people so he'll be more effective in sharing the truth. It has nothing to do with him falling out of grace or losing his salvation or losing certain wards. What he's saying in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, that he doesn't want to be disqualified from being effective in reaching those Corinthians with the truth. Never does he teach that you can be disqualified or you have to do things to remain qualified in the grace of God. Because if you have to do something to remain qualified, then you have to be doing it in flesh because Paul teaches that the only way you can be qualified or walk worthily is in that grace that you're trying to get to or maintain if you're saying you're disqualified. It's the chicken before the egg or the egg before the chicken. The grace comes first, then the walking worthily. And us walking unworthily cannot affect the grace at all because it wasn't our walk or anything we have done that tapped into that grace in the first place. So everything, anything we have done or not done cannot take us out of that grace. There is no such thing as having to do certain things to remain qualified or walk worthily so that grace will apply to you. That's the very opposite of grace. It's like, um, this movie um i don't like I, I don't know if i really liked the movie but it, it was interesting years ago I, it was called saving private ryan and uh there is an analogy in that movie you know it's a, about uh world war ii and this guy who who lost um private ryan was his name he lost like a bunch of brothers in the war maybe three four brothers, something like that. So they sent a mission to go save this private Ryan, you know, a, a group um, went in there and they ended up all losing their lives to save this private Ryan. And at the end where the one of the guys that that died for private Ryan, as he was dying on the battlefield, he said, as he's given his last breath, he says, earn this, earn this. And then at the end of the movie, it shows Private Ryan as an old man living out his life with his kids and grandkids and his family at the that guy's grave who said, earn this. And he said, I thought about what you said my whole life, and I've, I've tried, in essence, I'm paraphrasing here, I've tried to earn what you've done for me. And what he did for them is what, they all gave their lives. He gave his life so that Private Ryan would live. That's the same concept that we're talking about and that Paul teaches in his letters. Whether Private Ryan walks worthily or not, his life was saved by the men that went in there and gave their lives. So when the guy dying said, earn this, if Private Ryan went off and didn't care what those people did, he still had a life to live because those guys saved him. But in essence, what that guy said when he said, earn this, is the same as the Apostle Paul saying, walk worthily. So earn this. Live a good life because good men came here and I, as well, came here and gave our lives for you, Private Ryan. So make it count. Earn this, is what he said. If he didn't earn it, or he didn't walk worthily, it doesn't mean that he lost the life that these men gave for him and saving it. It just means that he's disrespecting them by not valuing the life that has been given to him. It's the same thing with the Apostle Paul. We are saved. We are in grace. That grace is ours no matter what. It covers everything everything but paul 
tells us to earn this, not earn it in a way that we have to do things in order to get the grace. And if we don't do those things, we'll lose the grace. He's not telling us to earn this in the sense that we have to walk worthily and remain qualified in that grace. And if we don't, then that grace won't cover everything. That's not what he's saying. That's not what earn this meant in saving Private Ryan, and it's not what walk worthily means when Paul uses that term or when he says stop sinning. Walk worthily. That's not what he is saying. What Paul is saying is that you have this grace and it covers everything. Now live a life that's worthy. Live a life that's thankful for this because it's been done for you. You don't have to earn it or walk worthily in the sense to make sure that it applies to you. It's already been done. Those men in Saving Private Ryan, they're dead. And they gave him that life. He has that life no matter what. In grace, we are given this life no matter what. And if we walk worthily, then we're showing our thanksgiving for that life and what has been done for us. If we don't walk worthily, then we still have that grace. It's been done for us. And no amount of walking unworthily can take that grace away. Because it's done. It's in Christ is our grace. We are in grace. And that's the starting point. Now, from there, we can walk worthily or unworthily. Of course, we want to walk worthily. That's the way grace works when we truly understand what has been done for us. Just like Private Ryan understood these men gave their lives for him. And so when he's standing at their grave years later, he tried his best to earn what those men did, not earn the life or earn the grace. He already had that. So when we walk worthily, we're not trying to earn or maintain that grace. We already have it. We're just trying to live a life in thankfulness and appreciation of the one who gave us that grace, which is Christ Jesus. There's no way we can walk unworthy enough to lose everything that grace has done for us. So what about us that sin so much? You know, people that sin so much. Well, any amount of sin, how do we overcome sin? We need, I think most would agree in the body of Christ that we need grace to overcome that sin. Well, how do we get that grace? Do we go to self and walk worthily? Or do we go to the source of grace to walk worthily, to overcome sin? Let's say there is sin in your life that, that you want to get rid of. Do you go to yourself to try to stop doing it and work on the flesh and overcome that sin? So now you can rest in the grace? That's what this comment is saying. Our sins are covered by grace as long as we're walking worthily and remaining qualified. The grace covers everything. So as long as you overcome that sin or do whatever you need to do to remain qualified, now that grace applies to you. So you go back to yourself, your flesh, to overcome the very sins that Christ died for? No, we go to the source. We go to Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, we have these things. In Christ Jesus, we have this grace. So there it is again. We go back to Christ. We go back to grace, even if we're in sin, in order to overcome that sin. And it's never, okay, I have to overcome this sin to get any component of that grace to apply to me. It's going to that grace to understand that no sin or nothing I do can affect the grace that I have. And then from there, that's the driving point. That's the starting point behind walking worthily or stop sinning as Paul instructs us to walk worthily in no way is this comment whoever made it accurate 
that you have to walk worthily to remain qualified, then grace covers everything. No, grace covers everything. That's the starting point. And to say you have to walk worthily in order to get into that grace or have any part of that grace applied to you means that you're walking worthily apart from the very thing that causes you to walk worthily, which is the grace in the first place. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. Um, if anyone was having issues with that, you cannot be touched by self when you're in the grace of God. And of course, that never means that you just go off will nilly and sinning and disrespecting the one who gave you that life. That's the opposite effect of grace. And people that think, and this is mainly Christians, that think having this grace causes you to go out and sin more. They don't have a clue what grace actually is. That man saving Private Ryan in the human fleshly form that those people are in, and any human that has another person sacrifice their lives so that they can live, would live that life in thanksgiving and appreciation on the human level. They wouldn't disrespect that person. Well, it's the same thing with grace. Christ did all this. He went to death. He was dead, entombed for our sins and was resurrected for us so that we have everything that he has. It's in grace that we have these things. So why would we go off and disrespect and live a life opposite of what Christ is and has told us to live? Why would we go opposite of that? If we truly understand grace, we want to live a life of thanksgiving and appreciation for what Christ did. But that has to be with the understanding that it's not about anything we do or don't do on any level. It's all about what Christ has done. So earn this, walk worthily, means that we are living in thanksgiving and doing the best we can in thanksgiving for what Christ has done. It's not about earning any part of the grace or walking worthily in order to get any part of the grace that Jesus Christ has already given us. And you can sugarcoat it with any sin you want. Oh, this person committed a horrible sin, so they're not walking worthily. So any believer that says you can commit certain sins and be out of grace, it all goes according to how well they're walking. You know, if they're committing a sin, then they'll say, oh, grace covers that. But if they've, you know, if grace has caused them to overcome that sin, then they'll say when other people fall into it, oh, well, that means you're not walking worthily. And now you need to do things of yourself to get back into that grace. No, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't go according to the way grace works at all. And Paul does not teach that. And obviously sinning causes effects in this life that are not pleasant. And it all affects our maturity because we want to get to be as mature as we can. But we don't get and I'm going to talk about L. Ray Smith here in a little bit. We don't get saved when we're mature. We're saved by the death for sin, the entombment of re and resurrection of Christ Jesus. Yes, eventually everyone will be mature. And we go through things in order to get to that maturity. But everybody, when they die, are going to be at different levels of maturity. That's not what saves us. What Ooh. saves us is Christ. And then we work towards maturity. And when we work towards that maturity, that's why we have the days of Christ. That's why works are burned. And yet we're saved by fire or through fire. That's why Paul talks about admonishing people as a brother. If we're all mature, then, and we always completed our salvation by our works, then there would be no reason at the dais or at any other time for works to be burned up. So I'll get into that a little bit more here um, in a moment. 
I did want to, um, I don't know if this might go too long. I'm going to end it here. Um, I was going to talk about L. Ray Smith. Um, you know, ah, it'll be too long. Yeah, I'm going to stop it here. Um, L. Ray Smith, in my next video, those of you that know him, um, I want to cut this video, so I'm not going to describe him that great in detail. I will in my next video a little bit. But he believes that we're saved. Now, this is a man who wrote about eternal hell, disproving it, who is a big believer in God's sovereignty, wrote great things to disprove human free will. This man is a believer, very knowledgeable. Um, actually, he's, he's dead now um, for some time, but he still has a website um, that is up and running. But great man, great believer. Um, but he believed that God did everything, but he believes that God does the works and that's part of our salvation. So we're saved by faith and works. And I want to discuss that a little bit just on how that can be, even if you believe that God does all of it and he believes in the salvation of all, of course, but to say that you're saved by actual works as opposed to understanding that it's grace that saves us and then the good works follow that salvation when we're in grace. So we're in grace and the good works follow that salvation. I want to talk about how preaching faith and works could distort um, the evangel as we look at it. But I'll look at that in my next video. Thanks for watching. All right. I do like Scott. I do too. He has such a uh, gentle way of teaching, and he always does it from the relative. Rarely, rarely does he go into the absolute. <clears throat> but when he does, he notates it. Yeah. He does a really good job of teaching from the perspective of the character on the stage, what he needs to see and understand. Hey, Dane. Hey, Gray. How's it going, man? Good morning, guys. Going great. Howdy, Dane. <laughs> we're, we're, we're trying to keep the show going, even though our cult leader <laughs> isn't here. <laughs> well, somebody's got to keep it going. Yeah. Currently, Ace is dropping a ball. Well, when he, when he passed me the administrative rights to assist him, it gave him the freedom to do some things that he wasn't able to do before, so. I really don't mind. Because he sits here sometimes three times a day for hours on end. And I'm sure it cuts into his schedule of gardening and washing clothes and making mama happy. Oh, yeah. Like they say, happy wife, happy life. Yeah. I was writing some software for a hospital in Piedmont, Georgia. And it took me about six months to write this software. And I'd come home from work and get on the computer and I'd be on the computer till like one in the morning, go to bed, sleep about three hours, get up, go back to work to repeat this until the weekend. And the weekend I'd get up like I was going to go to work and just go down to the computer and stay there till one in the morning and just repeat the same thing till I had this project done. And my wife just couldn't understand it. She said, you know something? All I see is the back of your head anymore. And, and all you do is play with that computer. You don't play with me. I said, but sweetheart, you just don't understand. When I stroke its keys, it responds exactly the way I want it to. And if it misbehaves, all I got to do is turn it off. I can't do that with you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I took a remote control one time and aimed it at her and started pushing buttons. I said, damn thing must need batteries. Man, she didn't speak to me for a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at least she's got a sense of humor. I won't, I won't say that. She didn't like it. <laughs> but I used to, we used to be arguing, and I'd, I'd ask her, I said, do you just like hearing your own voice? Because God created this day, and he created me to be this way, and you're not happy with it. 
So instead of complaining to me and listening to yourself complain, why don't you go pray to God that he consult you tomorrow on how he needs to create me, and that way you won't be so upset. That's an argument that women just cannot fight. There's nothing they can say that, that can go against that, if they have any faith in God at all. Yeah, they, they can say a lot of things, but they don't necessarily oh, yeah. have a ground to stand on. Well, I don't know if it's true for every woman because my last wife really didn't fall into this category, but my other wives, I'm sorry, better be the first thing off your lips and you're never going to hear them say it. Yep. But my last wife, she was different. She would say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I, I re overreacted on that and I apologize. And that, that was refreshing. Yeah, mine used to say, I'm sorry and you're wrong too. <laughs> I'm sorry. And you're wrong. I'm sorry, and you're wrong. I'm sorry that you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, and you're wrong. Go you on that. Uh, that's funny. Well, they don't. You know what's what's that old book say? Men are from Mars, and women from Venus. We're just two different creatures. <coughs> Well, I guess, Debra, you're right. You know, men probably don't say I'm sorry much on their own unless they're trying to make their wife happy. And that seems to be the way to make make their wife happy. Say I'm sorry and go buy them some jewelry or some little dangly thing that makes them feel good. I say I'm sorry all the time. Sorry you're so upset. Sorry you got such a small sense of humor. You know, all that good stuff. Yeah. So I missed it uh, earlier. What were you guys getting into earlier? Uh, it's been kind of a hodgepodge show today. There's some couple of archaeology ge or geology videos that Ace and Dale were bringing up. And we brought up a Scott Hicko video that you probably saw the last show. We read a little bit in Ephesians uh, 1, Ephesians 3, and a little bit in, I think it was Corinthians. But uh, just pretty much what anyone wants to talk about. Ace had to leave, and he's supposedly coming back soon. So I was trying to carry the show, and I'm not much of a producer or a director of the show. I'm more of a, a, a sidekick to help him manage things when he's not around. You uh, have yeah. a subject you want to bring up? Well, I always love the sovereignty of God, man. Oh, me too. I, do, I just... And you know, if, I don't go ahead. If God was to give away any of his sovereignty, he wouldn't be sovereign. Yeah, I, know. I was actually, uh, you know, it's funny. I'd actually like to talk to Scott Hicko a little bit because I know he's a teacher, right? Yeah. Now, I don't, I don't I, have the ability that Scott or or a lot of these other people that are YouTube presences um, at teaching, I get in front of a camera and I just, I get shy and my heart palpitates and I don't know, I'm afraid I'm going to make a mistake. And you know, I just, I just don't have that presence. But although, although I'm trying, I saw Jack's had a video yesterday that Leo published and man, if that girl, girl can get on there and say what she said, there's no reason why I can't too. Oh yeah. She did an excellent job. And you do. You're here on HBO a lot. Well, apparently that's where God wants me. <laughs> I guess that's where he has me appear. He <laughs> wouldn't be there if he didn't. Yeah. Well, it's, right, a, good yeah. it's a good platform. Ace is a, a good following, and people come here because they know that there's some joy that we experience that the other channels don't appear to have. So they kind of spy out our freedom, wanting to know what it is we're so joyous about. And we have people like Wildheart, who came in here as the resident atheist to mock Ace Theo, turning around and being a, a believer in the things Ace Theo is talking about. So it's uh, it's been quite a quite a change for him, and I'm sure there's other people that are having seeds that are planted from the Ace Theo show growing in them also. Yeah, when you find find out God is actually all about logic and, you know, 
that's not the old way of thinking that, you know, uh, faith in God is throwing common sense and logic out the window. It kind of changes your perspective on possibly who God is, you know? Yeah. And I, exactly. I think that's a big part that, that grabs uh, Wildheart is even if he doesn't believe everything that's being said and that God truly exists and all that, I think that he logically believes the the road that the ace goes down and, and a lot of people on this channel go down with the scripture. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So even if it's not that he believes God, he, he sees a better angle of the scripture logically than he does in the illogical way he was presented. It was presented to him, you know? Right. Right. Which, I mean, I think that's big. It's huge. Yeah. I was on a, another channel the other night and they didn't want to hear any scripture. And when I did, when I put scripture in the comments, I, mean, I got thrown off the channel twice and I put scripture in the comments. Oh, I don't believe that. That's not true. That's not, that's not what the Bible really says. That that's, that's an ace Bible. That's not Jesus Bible. Yeah. I just tell them, Hey, let's, let's pull it up in the King James. Well, they, no. didn't, they didn't want to, they, they approached that to some degree, but, but they were already dead set against what it had to say. And that's all right. God, the, the potter designed them to be that way. That's who they need to be displaying in the story so that this, this time that we're living in can be accurately display, displayed to the whole creation. You know what I think is awesome? It, up to this point, as far as I know, which I do believe that they will eventually destroy it. But First uh, Timothy four ten, and every translation that I've I've looked at so far, it hasn't been destroyed. They haven't managed to to be able to destroy the specific words claiming that God is the Savior of all mankind. Well, they they do. They've changed. They've changed it to God desires to save all mankind. Well, that's that's two four, right? Not four ten. Oh yeah, you're right. It is two yeah. four. Yeah, First Timothy two four. Yeah, and I get that. But then, also, I think even in their own translation, there's that scripture that says he does all his desire. Yeah, that's uh, Isaiah forty six. Uh -huh. All my desires shall I do, and all my counsel shall I fulfill. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, not that you can bring them there and they're going to put it together because they still have it in their head that. You know, they were raised up with John 3.16 or, you know, all that yeah. good stuff and, and told, you know, hey, you have to believe in order for God to be able to help you, you yeah. know, and uh, and it's your faith in Christ. It's not the faith of Christ, right. even though even though their translations in some places talk about the faith of Christ and then the faith in Christ, it's always the uh, faith in Christ that they they tend to hold on to, which I do agree that, you know, those that have faith in Christ are saved. You know, that that's a fact, but it doesn't tell us that that's how they were saved was their faith in Christ. And that's the, that's the big uh, problem, you know? Yeah. That's well, the, the hump to get over. Yeah, the churches teach that you have to have faith in Jesus. But the scriptures teach that it was the faith of Jesus in which our salvation lies. It was his faith walking the walk from the Garden of Gethsemane to the cross. It was his faith in his father's program, even though his father wasn't there cheering him on like he had been through his whole life. He carried what he believed his father wanted him to do on his own all the way to the point of death. And it says that in, in Philippians, that he was faith obedient unto the death of the cross. So he remained, remained obedient to the law and obedient to the plan that his father had told him that he was walking, even though his father wasn't there cheering him on during that last 24 hours of his life. But that's the faith that saves us. That's the faith that is not of us, it's of him. So at uh, Romans 3.21, I think it is, says that, the righteousness of God is being revealed through Christ Jesus' faith, or through Jesus Christ's faith. So it was through his faith that we got to be who we are. God's righteousness is being embodied in us. When we are taken off of this, off of this 
earthly realm and displayed in the celestials, it will be God's righteousness that is being displayed in us. What he did in us so that his righteousness could be known to the creation will become visible to all. And it was through Christ's faith that that could take place. You know, I was thinking the other night, and, you know, I don't know, there's no scripture to back this or anything, but I was thinking, I was asking myself the question, you know, why why couldn't God do it or whatever, but do you think it's possible that some or one or more than one, you know, all the the babies that uh, make it so far, but don't don't make it far enough to to see the light of day. You know what I mean? Yeah. And could it be possible that God could have chose any of those to uh, say be members of the body of Christ? I don't believe so. Uh, you don't think so, huh? No, there's there's like two places in Paul's evangel says that. You've got to believe that Jesus was here, died for your sins, and was resurrected by the power of God. If you've got those three things, you're in the body of Christ. And those babies you're talking about never have a chance to even know who Jesus is, much less believe he was here and died for their sins. Right. It's a nice thought that the innocents would be innocent to the point, you know, where they could they could be there too. But truth of the matter is they were born dead. They were born yeah, dying in true. the flesh already. The only That's reason true. we're not dying in the flesh is because Christ is, we were chosen in Christ before the disruption of the world to be holy and flawless in God's sight. The rest of humanity is not holy and flawless in his sight. Yeah, you're right. No, just a thought. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's us, us bringing these thoughts to each other on a relative plane that helps us understand what the absolute really means. <clears throat> Morning, Ace. Hey, sugar welcome, boy. Welcome back, Ace. Yeah. Your your, your 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 mic isn't working there, Ace. You're sure? <clears throat> okay. How about now? It sounds yeah, like good. you're sounds like you're on your PC or your laptop. This it doesn't sound like it's going through your mic. Testing, testing, testing. It sounds good to me, Dale. Uh, I can. I hear background. That's all. Hello. Tap, will, tap, will you tap on your mic, please? Yeah, yeah. I guess so. Okay. 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 <clears throat> we watched Scott's video from yesterday. It was pretty good. Oh, was it good? Yeah, he did a parallel between um, Saving Private Ryan. And Christ being sent to save us, to live your life. Remember on Private Ryan where they, all those guys died and they said, you know, we, we're here, we did this for you. Go ahead and live your life, live it to the fullest. And at the end, he's there with all of his grandkids and his kids at the grave next to this guy and told him, I tried to do the best I could to put to the best use what you guys sacrificed for me. And that's what, what we're to be doing too, is to be putting our best, best foot forward to live the life there. Christ has given us a hmm. good parallel. Really, really interesting. So, uh, so you got some competition there, Greg, and in, in movie analogies. Yeah, yeah, I like the one that um, Martin uses with the Wizard of Oz. That's good too. <laughs> yeah, that's why everyone likes my Howard the Duck movie analogy. It isn't makes it perfect sense. Yeah, isn't it interesting how we can see things in movies that we can't see in life? Well, I guess now that you're here, I'm going to go cut down some banana trees. Lord have mercy. I don't have many of them, thank goodness, but I'm going to go try and do it this year. I feel good enough to try. Okay, but well, thanks for uh, taking over for me. Sure, anytime, anytime. And if, if you're back on when I get back in, I'll pop back up. Sure. All right. Bye bye, everybody. See you, Dane. Bye, Dale. Have Have you trails to so you. long Later, to everybody Greg. in the, the trails. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. So long to everybody in the comment section. I hope you enjoyed it. Bye bye.
Did you guys spend any time with Ephesians? Uh, Greg, Greg read a little bit. Okay. Not, not, not much. Any, um, any fist fights with opposers who wanted to say that uh, free will is a wonderful thing? <laughs> we love free will. No. In the side chat, there is. Oh, is Josh C here? Yeah. Hey, Josh C, we love free will. Free will is the best. Free will saves us, don't you know? <laughs> <clears throat> So, hang on a second. Let's weave our way down to verse 3. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus through the will of God to all the saints who are also believers in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blesses us with every spiritual blessing among the celestials, according as he chooses us in him before the disruption of the world. Hey, Josh, see, look at this. According as he chooses us in him before the disruption of the world. What the hell? What choice did we have in him choosing us before the disruption of the world? Josh C., this doesn't sound very favorable to the Christian doctrine of free will. It sounds like something bigger is going on in time and space and reality and the purpose of God. According as he chooses us in him before the disruption of the world. Okay, so, okay, let's back up there. Blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. And thus the title of today's show, God Bless God. Because the word blessed, uh, we don't use it very much in popular English today. But um, blessed be the God. So can we say God bless God? God bless God. That would be a figure of speech, of course, because it wouldn't make really good sense to say God bless God. For those of you guys who are autistic and Asperger's, you want everything to make perfect mathematical sense. And it would not make any sense to say, God bless God. But, okay, so we got it here. We who, uh, you know, are a little bit more progressed than Asperger's and autistic fella. And can see combinations that are not very plain. We can say, God bless God. And verse 3, blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this kind of, this phrase here in verse 3, Ephesians 1, 3. Oh, my God. If you spend too much time on it, you will piss off the Trinitarians because they, they have it that Jesus is God. And they would never say, blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. But this whole thing, our understanding of God and his purpose is really much bigger than we can actually grasp. And I think it would be a great movement towards spirituality and toward maturity to say and acknowledge that this whole thing is much bigger than we can actually grasp at the moment. Blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. And remember, Paul says elsewhere to have a pattern of sound words. <clears throat> so we got it right here. Right here in the scriptures, verse 3. 
we can say, blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, without freaking out, without challenging, a challenging discussion. How dare you say that Jesus has a God? I don't know. What's it mean? How far do we take it? How far do we limit the godness of Jesus? Go ahead, Dale. Go ahead, Dane. I got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing. That's right. That's a good place to be. I'm just your friendly neighborhood Jack Kerouac with a Bible. Oh, look, here's the verbose. Joss C, God created potential evil with free will. Duh. Well, that's not the language of the Bible. The word potential. <clears throat> I'm kind of familiar with the Bible. I've never seen the word potential in the Bible. I did find the scripture, Isaiah 45, 7 and others, that plainly say God created evil, but it, nothing says God created potential evil. That's your insertion. The word potential is your insertion. Because you're afraid to accuse God of being God. How do you deal with God being God? Well, you invent a vocabulary. The word free will is not in the New Testament. The word potential is not in the whole Bible. And the only time the word free will shows up in the Old Testament is not as a doctrinal verse, but as the nomenclature of a specific kind of offering called the free will offering. It wasn't obligated but it wasn't a doctrine it wasn't a teaching it wasn't an understanding that we must have in order to be true christians the christian doctrine of free will is as they say in latin bullshitious you ever heard of that word dale i haven't that is yeah. the first time yeah. bullshitious it's an old latin word that means bullshit <laughs> Yeah. Similar to Nokitov. Yeah, yeah, the germ the Russian word Nokitov. Okay, let's see what the knuckleheads are saying now. God is actually good, and you guys, just like Calvinists, make him to be out to be evil and gross. Wow. wow. No, I didn't make God out to be evil. It would be evil if evil came in by some other way than God. That would be that create a huge problem in understanding. But if the good God created evil. Hmm, well, then we might be able to conclude that the good God created evil for a good purpose and therefore has limits and boundaries on what evil can do or how far it can spread because God is God and God is good and evil will serve his purpose, whatever purpose that might be. Illuminati Land says, if God didn't create evil, then logically evil just one day showed up as a complete surprise to God. <laughs> right. Good point, Illuminati Land. That's a very good point. Maybe Josh C. will somehow see the insight into your comment. And Anthony Pierce says, hmm, no, you make him out to be evil, Josh. Yeah, that's right, Josh. If God did not create evil, then you are making God evil by showing how weak he is and uninsightful. But if God has a purpose, 
and the, and evil serves his purpose, then bring it on. And you just haven't thought out the matter. You've got this idea that evil and sin are synonyms. They are not. Sin is a word and evil is a word and they're not synonyms. It's an evil thing to fall out of a tree. But you didn't necessarily sin by falling out of a tree. It just hurt like hell. And I think one of the brothers did some homework and found out that the word evil and the word breakage have something to do with each other. Earthquakes are evil. Tornadoes are evil. Yes, some human actions are evil. And some human actions are sin. And they might, they might be equated, but they might not be. Evil is a separate word and has a separate connotation than the word sin. And if God did not create evil, and evil somehow showed up outside of his creative ability and creative knowledge, if, it's, it, if it showed up, then it would be a sin. For its very existence, it would be a mistake because sin and, and mistake are they're closer to synonyms than sin and evil. It would be a mistake, a sin, if evil showed up without God's direction, purpose, and intention. We would have to revert to the Christian doctrine that there are two gods one good and one evil and they're they're not they're at, at each other's throats and and the evil god yeah he's going to win the biggest number in the end and the good god he's just going to have to settle for less than 20 percent because the war goes on you see but no josh there's only one god who created all things And Peter W. throws in his thought, God created creation. Yeah, well, that's kind of obvious. And creation created evil. Are you trying to get God off the hook? Creation didn't create anything. <laughs> creation is. Creation. <laughs> right. Peter W., you pretend that you are in love with the Bible. Check this out. Check out the word creator and creation throughout the whole Bible. And tell me if you find any verse at all that associates creation or creativity with the human. No, you will not. Every time the word cre creator and creation or creative shows up in the Bible, it's always associated with God himself. He is the creator. We are not creators. The best we can do is make a mess. You want to brag on your mess? Okay. As Anthony says, God is the creator, not us. As Josh says, free will gives potential of going against his will. Genesis 6 is proof, Sodom and Gomorrah, etc. Many more. What do you got on that, uh, Dale? Free will gives potential of going against his will. Yeah, that's still giving credence to the word free will, even though it's not a pattern of sound words. Let's defend free will at every turn. Uh, Josh, please make a comment about the human will, not the human free will. The will of man is a thing that we can discuss, and the will of God is a thing we can discuss. But free will is an invented term. And I think you would do better to drop it out of your vocabulary of discovering the truth. 
did God cause Joseph's brothers to go against God's will by selling him into slavery? Yeah, good question. There really is a big difference between God's will and his in intention. Yeah, it takes a bit of maturity to even think outside the box and think that there's a an intention and a will. And since, Josh, see, since we know that the cross of Christ is God's major design, it would make sense that God intended for Adam to enter into a sorry state of affairs so that God could save Adam and his race from a sorry state of affairs. We cannot save ourselves. Peter W. says, man in his state of innocence has freedom and power to will and do just what was good and well pleasing to God, but yet was unstable so that he might fall, fall from it. Okay, let's, you want to tackle this one, Dane? Oh, shit, I'm sorry, Ace. I was talking my mouth off to somebody else, but tackle right. what? Just just tell me what, and I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to no, give no, you no. my... No, no freelancing here. No okay. winging it. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dale. Go ahead, Dale. Well, <laughs> if Adam, if Adam was unstable, well, God created him. Yeah. If he, if he was unstable, then that's that's back, that's back on God for making him or creating him unstable. So I'm not sure where Peter W. is right. coming Did up God with. not know that Adam was unstable? Was it a surprise to God that Adam was so-called unstable? Hey, what about that scripture? Behold, the Lamb of God slain before the disruption of the world. That's a good, good question, yeah. All right, but the... The query before us by Peter W. Man in his state of innocency had freedom. So when man was innocent, he had freedom. But now that man is not innocent, do we not have freedom? Hmm. Is that what you're saying? You need to clarify your where you're going with this. So man, in his innocent state, had freedom and power to will and to do that which was good and well-pleasing to God, but yet was unstable so that he might fall from it. That sounds like a storyline, a narrative, but it doesn't sound very clear like what the Bible has taught about the human's origins and sin's origins and the plight of us all in Adam. And Illuminati Land says, hey, Peter W., Adam and Eve had, had no power to do good or evil. They got that power from eating from a tree that God planted in the garden. Yes, indeed. And Josh says, God's will is not happening all over the earth right now as it is being done in heaven. Is it being done in heaven? One can only hope. Peter W. says they were doing good before they ate from the apple. They were doing good. I don't know what that means. Did they build a hospital? No, a hospital wasn't necessary at that time before they ate of the apple. What kind of good were they doing? They were lazy. Weakness is not an evil, is not evil, says Dirty Varmint. Uh, Deborah says, A and E, nothing about, A 
and he knew nothing about evil, Peter. They, ne they never saw evil or experienced it before they ate. Yeah, that'll teach him a lesson. Anthony Pierce says, free will is a toddler understanding. How does anyone still believe in free will? The simple thought and logic proves free will is not even possible. Simple thought and logic proves free will is not even possible. Yeah, okay. Up next, Peter W. says, they knew good, they knew God. Yes, Peter W., in the garden before they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they didn't know that it was good. They had it good. You can say they had it good, but you can't say they knew good because you don't know what good is unless you have something to compare it to. And in the Garden of Eden, before they ate of the knowledge of good and evil, they didn't know good and evil. And it wasn't two separate trees, Peter W., the tree of the knowledge of good, and then down the street was the tree of the knowledge of evil. No, it was both the knowledge of good and evil wrapped up in one tree and its fruit. And Barmet says, if God is weak, is he not God? Yeah, that's a good question, baby. And Illuminati Land says, Peter W., they were not doing good before the fall. They had no good or evil in them till after the tree event. That's a very good point there, brother. The Illuminati land. Go ahead. Uh, I, was just sniff I was just sniffing. Yeah. Uh, Peter W. says, Adam was made good. Good golly, that's what I say. Deborah says, they were like God. They weren't like God. I'm sorry, they weren't like God, Peter. Without understanding evil, they had no idea what it was. Good point. Up next is Deborah again. Adam was made good for the purpose God had him here for. Adam was made good. Okay. Uncle Barmet says, let him who boasts, boast in this, that he knows me, that I am Yahweh, who practices steadfast love. Justice and righteousness in earth doesn't mention evil. You can always trust a dirty varmint. And Jossie says, free will is a fact that real adults accept. Toddlers reject it so they can blame God for their sin. And there is spelled incorrectly <laughs> and evil actions. Okay, so go ahead, uh, Dale. Knock it out of the ballpark. Uh, I, I got nothing. Okay, free will is a fact. <laughs> free will is not a fact. Free will is a notion. It is a word that Christians throw around that's not in the Bible. And even Webster's Dictionary gives one of the definitions of free will, an idiotic definition, that free will is the choices made without prior causes or divine intervention. So, Josh, are you saying that there is such a thing as a choice that has no prior causes and no divine intervention? If that's what you think, I don't think we're on the same page of conversation. There is no such thing as a choice that has no prior causes and no divine intervention. That is a bullshit concept. And if you believe that, you do not believe in God, who is, in fact, divine intervention. But if you claim to be a Christian and believe in God, then you would be willing to talk about divine intervention because divine intervention is what it's all about. That's what we're exploring here. Just how far does divine intervention show up in our life, in the scriptures, and in the future, and in the past? What is divine intervention? We are seeing the will of God played out in front of us. It was the will of God in reality 
for Adam to eat of the forbidden fruit. Because divine intervention is a thing. And God made sure that Adam ate of the fruit. The very first movement toward that goal of getting Adam to eat of the fruit is God said, do not eat of that fruit. God must be a master of reverse psychology. If God truly didn't want him to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he would have put the tree in Miami and he would have never brought up the conversation. He wouldn't have said, hey, do not eat of that tree. That's reverse psychology. And if he had put it in Miami, the tree in Miami, and he still kind of wanted Adam to eat of it, he said, hey, there's a tree in Miami. I don't want you to eat of its fruit. Well, then what the hell is he going to do? He's going to build a ship and sail to Miami <laughs> and look for this tree that he's not supposed to eat. But God brought it up. What was it? Just a, an idle test? If God brought it up, he brought it up for a purpose. And not only did he bring it up with Adam, he brought it up with a, a, a huge tornado of influential factors. A talking snake, a good-looking woman who fell for it, made, this, made the fruit look good, put it right there in the midst, spoke to him in a language of ignorance because Adam did not know good or evil and Adam did not know what death was. He didn't know good or evil. All he had was good, but he didn't know it was good because he didn't know good from evil. And all knowledge, Josh, all knowledge is a comparative contrast value. We know that two plus two is four because it's not five, it's not three. And we only know what good is when we know what evil is. And we only know what evil is when we know what good is. You got to know both before you can compare them and contrast them. So you say free will is a fact. Why can't you say that God's will is a fact? Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 says, God is operating all things according to the counsel of his will. Can you agree that God's will is a thing? Does God get his will? Or does God submit his will to the human? That would put the human in a superior position that would make the human into God. And God would be a lesser being if God has to subject his will to the human will. In essence, you are glorifying the human, Josh, with your silly notions. Free will is a fact that real adults must accept. Real adults. Real adults. Yeah, what's that? You got a sliding scale on what a real adult is? Oh, if they agree with you, then they're a real adult. If they don't agree with you, they're just childish. Toddlers, yeah, toddlers. reject, yeah, toddlers. Toddlers reject free will. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm probably older than you, Josh. And so I can say that when I was younger and stupider, it was easier to accept the notion but now that I'm older, it's not that I'm getting stupider. I can see the bullshittery of the Christian doctrine of free will. God is operating not some things after the counsel of his will, but all things after the counsel of his will. And it's not that Ephesians 1.11 is our only scripture. Oh, we got Romans, how about 8? Romans 8, 20 and 21. It says, to vanity was the creation subjected against its will. 
Check it out, Josh. See Romans 8, 20 and 21. All of creation was subjected to vanity against its will. What kind of free will is that? That is, that proves that your Christian doctrine of free will is bullshit. If the scriptures plainly say that, that all of creation was subjected to vanity against its will. And it goes on, the verse goes on to explain what is going on in the mind, intention, and purpose of God. It, it continues by saying it's all for a purpose that creation was subjected to vanity against its will. And what was that purpose? That purpose is that creation, all creation will be set free from the slavery of corruption into the glorious freedom of the children of God. But you Christians know nothing about that. You are so in love with your free will and your precious moral example and you have stopped sinning and nobody else has stopped sinning and you deserve to go to heaven and nobody else does because you are different okay free will is a fact that real adults accept toddlers reject it so they can so reject it so they can blame god for their sin t-h-i-e-r and evil actions etc well, I don't know any toddlers, I mean real toddlers, who blame God for their stealing the cookies. They do try and get out of it. They blame the dog. <laughs> the dog ate my homework type thing. But they don't blame God. They don't say, well, God made me not do my homework. They don't, I've never heard a toddler say that. Uh, next. Peter W. Oh, yeah, this is Illuminati land saying, yes, Peter W. Adam was made good because God created him, but Adam had no knowledge of good and evil till the tree event. Amen, Illuminati land. How'd you get to be so smart? Deborah says evil is mentioned in many places. Dirty. Many places like Amos chapter 3, verse 6. And Isaiah 45, 7. God create is the only creator. And so, yes, God did create evil. And one of the reasons you guys reject this notion is because you've got the idea that evil has moral connotations attached to the word. It might have some moral connotations attached to the word in some contexts. But evil in the biblical language is just breakage. It's not necessarily a moral thing. It's just a regrettable situation. If man does evil most of the time, it has a moral connotation to it. But if God does evil, like sending Christ to the cross, well, it has a... It doesn't have a moral connotation, except it has a good intention, which will be brought about by God. And Christ was broken on the cross. Thank God, God created evil. Otherwise, we, we should worry about getting out of bed in the morning. Peter W. says, Illuminati land, did Adam know God? Okay, uh, instead of waiting for Illuminati land to answer, I'll say, did Adam know God? To a degree. Mm -hmm. To a degree before the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he knew God. And to a interesting, more interesting degree after the tree of the knowledge, he knew God to some other level. But did he know God as he will know God? In the future, he will know God more fully in the garden. Before the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he didn't know Jack. He didn't know what evil was or good. He didn't know what death was after the tree of the knowledge of good and evil event. 
he we might be able to say he knew God a little better in in order to to show this he he hid from God and God said Adam where are you as if God didn't know where he was just playing along right Adam where are you so he knew enough more enough about God to know that he better hide there was some trouble some troublesome thing going on but when Adam finds himself in Christ as all in Adam will find themselves in Christ and then then Adam along with the rest of us will know God and be known by God I wonder I wonder if Adam actually thought by hiding from God that God <laughs> didn't know where he was. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of proves uh, his lack of the knowledge of God, right? Yeah. If I hide, he won't know I'm here. And I can blame the woman. Let's see if I can get away with it. The dog ate my, my homework. Oh... Another dirty varmint smarty pants says, let him who boasts claim in this that he knows me, that I am Yahweh who practices evil calamity and causes despair in the earth. Ace translation. Oh, dirty, you're so cute. Anthony says to Josh C, no, you're a toddler. That can't have thoughts deeper than the surface. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Josh C says, Ace blames God for evil. No, the word blame is not right. I credit God. Blame is so negative. <laughs> Come on, Josh. I credit God for all things. Josh, have you ever heard of this other scripture? Like Romans 11, 36, it says, all is out of him and through him and for him. All is out of him and through him and for him. I credit God. I don't blame God. And that would be a dirty varmint kind of lingo. Dirty blames God. You blame God for not creating evil, but allowing evil to come into existence apart from his own divine intention and plan. You blame God for being stupid. Somehow evil snuck in on him. He's surprised. He's got to deal with it. Let's go to plan B. Oh, that didn't work. Let's try plan C. Oh, man, that didn't work. Let's try plan F or H or K. Oh, yeah, K will work. Yeah. I don't blame God for evil. I credit God for evil. Josh, listen. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, Joseph says to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. What do you like? You like the Bible? Check out Genesis 50, verse 20. Illuminati Land says, Peter W. says, uh, absolutely, Adam knew God, so did Eve. I might disagree a little bit, Illuminati Land. I would say relatively, Adam knew God. He didn't know God fully, as he will in the future. Deborah says, did God sin with Adam and Eve? If he didn't make a mistake or sin, what happened? Peter W. says, is God good? Yes, God is good. Peter W., God is good. And out of his goodness, he creates all things for a purpose, including evil and vanity and frustration and hardness of heart and blinded eyes. All this Death. is of God. Go ahead. Death. Death, yeah, God makes people deaf. God blinds Kills. Israel. He kills them. God kills and makes alive. Yeah, that's a that's a Bible verse. Deal with it, baby. God kills and makes alive. Anthony Pierce says he doesn't blame God. God has a purpose for evil and everything. 
your simple mind can't see things because you're locked up in stubbornness. And Romans 11, 32 says God locks all up in stubbornness. And Deborah says free will is an illusion, Josh. Step into the light. And Josh says, yes, it's obvious deep thinkers understand that God does not cause evil or sin. Okay, so you are a deep thinker. So glad that you're hanging out with us, Josh, to share your deep thoughts. <laughs> Deborah says, explain why scriptures say God created evil, like Isaiah 45, 7, Amos 3, 6, etc. Uh, God sinned if he caused Adam to sin without a purpose. That's a good point, yeah. And Josh says, again, just like Calvinists, you need to blame God. No, 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 Josh, we credit God for all things. We don't blame God. Blame would be, you know, thinking that you can do better. That would be like Karen or like the, the harpy that lives next door. Credit blame, has, God. Yeah, blame has a negative connotation, so... Uh huh. That's that's all. Okay, what's it say uh, again? Just like Calvinists, you need to blame God and do not accept responsibility for your actions. Huh? It used to be the devil made me do it, but you guys say God made me do evil and sin and good grief. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see. What do we got with this word responsibility? Does the word responsibility ever show up in the Bible, Josh C? Help me out, Josh C. Do you see any place in the Bible where the word responsibility shows up? Come on, be a good Bible student. Use your concordance, your Strong's concordance, and let me know. If you find the word responsibility, let me know. I'd love to see it. So I can say that God is the source of all things. And I can say that God will hold us accountable, but the word responsible and accountable have two different connotations. And God is responsible for his whole creation. And if certain members of creation have to give an account of themselves, yeah, that's a different thing. Giving an account of yourself and being responsible are two different things. Like a soldier, a private in the in the military is held accountable for whether or not he obeys an order or <clears throat> attacks the enemy. But he's not responsible for winning the war. Responsibility is a bigger word than accountability in its usage and scope. Peter W. says there are primary causes and secondary causes. And Peter W., you're so cute. You're just like J.G. and your secondary causes. So let's talk about secondary causes. What if you're one domino in a line of 1,000 dominoes, you know, and you tip over the first one with the finger flick? And it's going that would be the primary cause, right? And the secondary cause is the first domino hits the second domino, which hits the third, which hits the 84th, which hits the 99th, which hits the 285 domino. Tell me about secondary causes. Is there such a thing as a choice with no prior causes and no intervention by the divine? <clears throat> Let's blame God for what Adam did. No, let's credit God for having a complete story. Because if Adam, Mr. Varmint, had obeyed the command not to eat of the forbidden fruit, would we still be in the Garden of Eden as a species, as descendants of Adam? What kind of Fucking storyline would that be? That would be a, that'd be like a Twilight Zone episode. We're all born, 
and we don't know good from evil, but we have it good. You know, it's just we wake up each day. We don't even have to get out of the bunk. We just reach over and grab a banana and eat it and go back to sleep. What? There's nothing. We would have it good, perfect weather. Walk around naked all the time because the weather's so perfect. Sunshine, no clouds, no thorns. Blame God? <clears throat> Let's credit God for God's doings and his creative ability. Because creation began, but it wasn't complete in the garden. There was still a lot of incomplete details. And creation to this very day is not complete. It will be complete in the eons to come. <clears throat> and we know this from Paul's teaching, dirty varmint. I know you don't like Paul, so what? Paul says in the eons to come, this and this and this will happen. You have no idea because you fancy that you know better than God himself. I don't blame God. I credit God for moving Adam along out of the garden. In the Christian universe, they say Adam fell. In the Bible, Adam never fell. The Bible never says what Adam did was a fall. <clears throat> that is a human invention, a Christian invention to call Adam's action the fall it is movement adam did come to know the difference between good and evil and he was kicked out of the garden but we might uh, have every reason to call it progress a nasty kind of progress but progress because the real goal is for god to become all in all which apparently takes a few eons to pull off Deborah says, that's not true, Peter. The only cause is God. Peter says, let's not, dirty. Dirty says, Adam blamed Eve for what Adam did. Sounds Eve. like, Go ahead. So, sounds to me like Adam blamed Eve as a causal factor. Mm -hmm. Which was I would... Adam wrong to blame Eve? <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. She was definitely a a strong, motivating. She was strong and independent, woman. right? She was the feminist <laughs> of her day. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me about accountability. Hand clippers are the little red ones. Same thing with Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. Yep. He, the, the serpent did indeed trick her. And did she take accountability or responsibility? She blamed the snake. Did the snake take accountability or responsibility? <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Who, if God who, didn't do it, the snake did it, right? Who created the snake? Okay, let's see. Let's see. Let me think. Let me think. Oh, yeah. We're supposed to scroll down here. Up next is Deborah says, God blames himself. You need to read The Problem of Evil by A.A. Nock, free on the Concordant Publishing site, concordant.org. Know-it-all varmint says, passing the blame is what got us into this mess. We are not in a mess. Hmm. Your plan, dirty varmint, to get out of this mess gets us deeper into the mess. Because your plan is do good works, obey the law, et cetera, et cetera. And that doesn't seem to work. We've had 5,000 years of you guys saying that. Didn't. 
We're deep into it. Peter W. says, man, by his fall into a state of sin, has wholly lost all ability of will. Am I reading this right? Man, by his fall into a state of sin, I've already discussed it. The Bible doesn't call it a fall, but we'll go with you. Man, by his fall into a state of sin, has wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as a natural man, being altogether averse from the good and sin and dead and sin. I don't know what you're talking about. Do you know? Bill? No, I, I, no, I don't. It sounds like a, a blathering storm. I guess dirty. It's all God's fault. <laughs> No, it's to God's credit because God is the creator of all and the finisher of all of his creation. And he will finish what he's doing. It's just not done yet. Creation has begun, but it's by no means finished. So hold your horses, dear Josh and dear Peter and dear Dirty. Peter says, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or prepare himself thereunto. Oh, that must have been part of this other thing here. So let's put it together. Man, by his fall into a state of sin, has wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as a natural man, being altogether averse from the good and the deed and, the, and dead to sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or prepare himself thereto. Okay, I heard it. I still think it's blathering. Uh, let's see. Josh C. Flip Wilson said, the devil made me do it. It's not scripture. I remember Flip Wilson. Peter said, they named the animals. What does that have to do with anything? Deborah says, the problem of evil by A. Enoch is amazing. And yes, it is. I've read it several times. Banana pig pear peaches, who knows? Kate says, be a Christian, learn to guard traditional feel-good tropes and copes. <laughs> it's a great book. I read it twice. I'm still going back to look things up. Dirty Barman says, you don't know what life is until you die. Quote, unquote, ace. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Kind of true, yeah. Dirty says, I know Josh says, Dirty, just remember to blame God every time you sin, okay? MIT grads reject free will too, says Cade. In the relative, we're responsible. In the absolute, God is responsible for everything. Get it, says Deborah. Free will is their Trojan horse. That's a good analogy. Because once you get free will in the door, man, all this other nasty yeah. things come out of its belly. Got that right. Like eternal conscious torment and trinity and the immortal soul and all the other crap that goes along with free will. Peter W. says God has, God has his perspective will and God has his decree. Yes, God has his perspective will, and God has his decree. Perceptive. Okay. Is that what it says? Perceptive? Yeah, what the hell does yeah. that mean? Sounds like a Calvinist type of slogan. You were Calvinist at one time. Yes, I was. To a degree. Did you ever see the term perspective will? Perceptive will? Sounds in your, familiar. In your Calvinist literature? I would think, well, I don't remember it in any literature, but I think what Peter's trying to say is his perceptive will is like what he allows, but he still has his decrees. He, 
Yeah, the way you and I talk about it is uh, God has his will and God has his intention. Right. And nobody can violate his intention. He gets his intention every time, even though his will might be opposed like Adam did and like Pharaoh did because Pharaoh was said, let my people go. So that's obviously the will of God. But the intention was for Pharaoh not to let the people go until there had been a complete demonstration of the power of God with those 10 plagues. So God's intention was to show up the 10 plagues. But God's will that would, was, be, yeah. that would be equivalent with his decree. Mm -hmm. His Maybe intention, so, yeah. his intention is the same as his decree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dirty Varmint loves Ace, even though Ace is wrong. Yeah. And Ace says, bite me. I don't care what you think. Deborah says, Peter, God is the only one who determines everything. It's his story all the way. It's his story all the way. Amen. Mm -hmm. Dirty Varmint says, Cassius Clay. <laughs> Cassius Clay, sorry. <laughs> Kate is Clay. Those same MIT grads say the universe popped out of nowhere. Peter W. says God has decreed all things. Yeah, okay. I think we're on the same page if I understand you. Cade, they say there is no God. Wait, wait. Let's go back to that. God decrees all things? Oh, yeah, okay. So God decreed that Joseph's brothers would sell him into slavery. Mm -hmm. Yes. Something tells me Peter wouldn't go, go along with that. But. Let's see. Uh, Cade, their claim that there is no free will is based on the assumption that there is no God. Josh worships at the altar of his own free will, free being will, his own will being free. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, dirty, for I have added, I have to add the word some in front of MIT, right? Cade says, I mean, dirty says to Cade, if there is no God, then they are right. There is no free will. Max says, I'm listening. I can't hip it. <laughs> Josh says, the gift of God is free will. It is not. The gift of God is Christ on the cross. Knock that out of the park, if you will. God didn't give us a free will. He gave us Christ on the cross. The gift of God is free will, the ability to say yes or no to anyone, including God. God honors that. God did not make a robot creation. What are you talking about, Josh? There are so many things in our life that are dem demonstrably not free will. You ever heard of a shotgun wedding? It's still a thing. I mean, we have lots of motivational forces to do everything we do. So we can't just say yes or no to anyone. Sometimes there's a gun to your head making you say yes or no. Like the tax man knocking at your door. <laughs> Like uh, the mafia gang holding your wife hostage. Uh, like uh, the cop who puts a boot on your car if you don't pay the parking ticket. Can you say no to the cop who writes you a parking ticket? <laughs> How about, what do you say on that, Dale? Well, I'm struck by this statement. He says, God did not make a robot creation. Robots are not sentient beings. Mm -hmm. 
so just because he causes whatever it takes to make us willing to do this that and the other thing doesn't make us robots we're still sentient beings we still have thoughts and feelings and uh, emotions uh, I, I don't I, I I don't get that robot uh, analogy. I, I just don't get it. Neither does he. Because if we're looking around throughout the scriptures to see anything close to a robot, we got this clay business. He's the potter and we're the clay. So it's worse than robots. <laughs> At least robots can have the appearance of making a decision. But even robots, Josh, if you know anything about the robot world, AI world, every damn computer, robot, and so forth out there cannot do anything unless they are programmed to do it. In fact, we learned just the other night here on this channel that it is impossible for computers, robots, to shuffle cards and create a random experience of those 52 cards in that deck. It's impossible. So the guys who run these gambling sites, or at least the largest gambling site in the world, they created a, a system whereby <clears throat> light was shown through an opaque mirror. And the light that bounced off in this direction was assigned a one. The light that bounced off in that direction was assigned a zero. And so the robot would assign each beam of light, a one or a zero, and then it gives the appearance of being randomly sorted <clears throat> so that the 52 cards look like they're shuffled and dealt out evenly. But a just a regular computer cannot make anything random. Really? Yeah. But this uh, gives the feeling of randomness because each of these beams of light, you don't know how it's going to scatter. So that is the true randomness. And each beam of light, a short wave or a long wave, is assigned a number by the computer. And then that number is assembled into the 52 card deck. As it appears. So there's a feeling of randomness. Anyway. So the gift of God is free will. This is bullshit, Josh. The gift of God is Christ on the cross. And all that it accomplishes in bringing us to the knowledge of God and saving us from death itself. Free will is not the gift of God, except in your construct. But it's not, you can't show through any verse in the Bible that says the gift of God is free will. That's your, that's your storyline. But you're forcing your storyline into the Christian discussion. The ability to say yes or no to anyone, including God. You cannot say yes or no to anyone. At what point does the yes or no show up? The freedom to say yes or no. When you're three years old? When you're five years old? When you're 15 years old? Let's say you're 55 years old. Can you say yes or no at any point to your parents? No, there are influential factors. Even when you're 55 and they're 75, there are influential factors. You may love them. You may not love them. Either way, the yes or no is not a free will decision. It is an influenced decision based on your history with them, your motivation, based on the amount of money that you're going to inherit if they die <laughs> under your care. <laughs> you can't say yes or no to the cops when they're knocking on your door, to hauling your car away because you didn't pay the damn parking ticket. You can't say yes or no to the neighbor who knocks on your door and with a smile says, hey, can I borrow a cup of sugar? <laughs> you will say yes or no based on influential factors, whether or not you like that neighbor, 
You want to get rid of them. You want to be able to go get sugar from them on occasion. Whether or not she's wearing a bikini when she knocks on your door. God did not make a robot creation. God is not finished with creation yet. That's for sure. We won't even know what creation is yet. And for a couple more eons, when he's finished with creation, then we can talk about what God has made. God has begun creation, but it is not finished yet. And the mathematical proof is that tomorrow, Josh, tomorrow there will be some kids born. And the next day they will be one day old. And in one year they will be one year old. God is not finished with creation yet. So how do you know what God is doing? God did not make a robot creation. How about this? God is making a new creation. You ever heard of a new creation? Are you a Bible student, Josh? In Christ's death and resurrection, he makes a new creation. What is that? It's not the born again metaphor. It's entirely different language. We only see it with Paul. In Christ, there is a new creation. It's not a robot creation. We won't even see the end of it for a while yet. Or the beginning of it, really. We're barely into this new creation. Christ has been roused from among the dead, the first fruits of them that repose. You are right. God did not make a robot creation. He did make a new creation in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, it says, dirty the point, MIT grades, the some that laugh at free will, they're not childish, they are adults. Dirty says, fair enough, Cade. Illuminati Land says, the gift of God is free will. <laughs> and he says, what, with three question marks? Good job, Illuminati Land, you caught on there. And how ridiculous that notion is. No, the gift of God is salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. God bless Illuminati Land, he's got the goods. There's no Bible verse. That says there is no free will, but neither is there a Bible verse that says there is a free will. Adam subjected the creation to that because Adam chose unwisely. Josh, get your act together. Romans 8.20 doesn't say that Adam subjected the creation to vanity. It says that God subjected creation to vanity against creation's will. Do you get it, Josh? Romans 8, 20 and 21. Romans 8, 20 and 21. I'll say it again. Go ahead, grab a pencil, write it down so you can look it up. Romans, R-O-M-A-N-S, 8, dot, dot, 20, dash, 21. God created, subjected all creation to vanity. Adam had to play his part in the in the bringing of this about. Jesus said salvation is inheritance, not a gift. Inheritance is a right, not a gift. Okay, it's an interesting discussion to go down. So Josh C. is a real adult and we ain't. Oh, I want to be like Josh. Me too. Yes, free will is a fact. Calvinists and universalists reject that. But just like when people believe the earth is flat, still doesn't make it flat. Okay. Romans 13. Whosoever therefore resisteth power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. King James Bible. What is your point there, Jill? Hi, brother. Peace and blessings to you. Josh, see the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, not free will. Amen. Illuminati land, do you have heart? do you have to believe to be saved, or does God save everyone? Romans 12. Let love be genuine, and for that which is evil, hold fast to that which is good. What's your point? Peter W. Broker of Peace says hello. Dirty Varmint says, Peter, yikes, good verse. 
Hi. Hi. Even Paul says a good verse once in a while. Every stray dog gets a bone. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are you saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. To believe is a gift of God. Luminati land, yes, the best gift is Jesus, and the second best gift is free will. <laughs> Josh C., you get the hard-headed award of the day. Peter W. and Josh mustered up the ability to hold fast. All else are hellfire fodder, and it served them right. They should have been like Josh and Peter W. That's funny. Cade, <clears throat> that was Paul that said that. Do you agree with Paul saying that? I'm not going to back up to figure that out. Adam hiding shows how childish she was. <clears throat> Uh, let's see what we got here. I want to be like you and ooby do. I want to be like you. <laughs> Josh is simply a disagreeing chat rat. So Josh says, okay, so Ace credits God for evil, like man raping a child, Hitler's army, Hitler's Germany, etc. Very nice. You give God credit for all that. Oh, poor Josh. Don't you see? Haven't you ever thought that God meant it for good? Even though it appears to us to, us to be evil. Wow. Why doesn't God stop all this evil and sin, Josh? Yeah, why doesn't God? If God is God, why doesn't he stop evil and sin? Huh, huh, huh? God also says, choose this day. Whatever that means. I don't care about the future, but I care. What about all the evil that happened in the past, present, and future? God watches and twirls his thumbs because he's unable to stop it, you say. Our choices are God-inspired. Calvinist, what's the beef with Calvinist? Limited atonement is my beef with Calvinist. Uh huh. Calvinists say God chooses those in heaven and those in hell. <laughs> Choose to go there, it makes no sense. Jill says men crept in unawares and were able to ordain to this condemnation on godly men turn. Blah, 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 whatever that is all about. Filet mignon of theology. That's funny. Calvinists say every, everyone is going to hell, but God saves many of them. When my grandpa raped my aunt, she was forced to get an abortion at 13 as a 13 year old girl. So he would avoid jail. That was God inspiring him to do that. You guys are nuts. Oh God. So that's the only evil you got. I tipped myself over middle domino. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Secondary causes. What you got on secondary causes? I tipped myself over. 
Them Christians need love like us Christians do in Christ Jesus. You hate God, Josh. You hate the truth. You hate that he created evil. I'm sad that happened to your aunt, but God is responsible for it. Yeah. In the grand scheme of things, God is responsible for all creation. <laughs> And all that happens in creation. And there are some times when a naughty sexual act has turned out good. See, I remember, and I told this story before, this gal was looking at a picture of her great-grandmother hanging on the wall. And in the, in the picture was her great-grandmother's two brothers and two sisters. All five of them were in one picture. And she knew, along with the rest of the family, that this great-grandmother was a naughty little girl, a sexual deviant. She had sex with a married man at age 14, 15, got pregnant by him. She was naughty. She was the talk of the town. And she even had probably had sex with him a second time, had a second child. Oh, my God, she just wouldn't stop that naughtiness. And the two brothers and the two sisters were good. And decent and moral and respected in the town. And this woman was looking at this very old, old picture from the 1800s. And all of her family knew about how sinful this young girl was, which turned out to be her great grandmother. And it dawned on her on this day. Oh, oh. It dawned on her that there were 287 people alive today, thanks to this great-grandmother and the two brothers and two sisters in the picture who were so moral and upstanding in the community. They didn't have any kids, and, and the, the lineage stopped dead with them. But there were 287 people alive today, thanks to this naughty great-grandmother who was horny or whatever her problem was. Which, which of those siblings did good and which of those siblings did evil? Could we say in the long run that the brothers and the, the two brothers and two sisters did evil by not having any children? They did evil by being upstanding citizens in the community? <laughs> what is your view on these matters, Josh? And Peter W., could it be said that this great-grandmother did good in being a homewrecker, making this married man have sex with her, and she had two children by this married man? Would any of those 287 people alive want to give up their life just to say, this ain't right, that, that woman shouldn't? Oh, never mind. Never mind, Peter W., the primary cause is having a son. The secondary is him murdering someone. Having the son is the primary cause, but the secondary cause, the murderer, is culpable. Jealous of cute Peter. Deborah, you are officially a psychopath then, and you want God to be a psychopath. Apparently... Did God stop it, Josh? Was it for a purpose? And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, the real fall of man. There you go, Illuminati land. That's an interesting notion. A fall of a deep sleep. Did Adam have a free will in the creation of Eve? <laughs> Or did he wake up and lo and behold, there's this troublemaker that we call a woman. <laughs> what the hell? This is not free will. This is somebody attached to your side like a, like a, what do you call those things where this two-headed monster, two-headed baby? Tony!
Hi. Am I still on the show? Yes, you is. Oh. Anybody with a beard like that, we have to have them in the show and quick. Thumbs up. Howdy, Tony. I won't. I keep hearing a, an echo. Close your YouTube. I have to hang up. I'll be right back. Close your YouTube tab. Oh, close. Hang on. Am I still in? Yes, you are. You're in. You still hear an echo? Okay, I'm not hearing an echo. No. Hey. 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 Are you guys talking about me again? Yep. Mr. Free Willer. That's what we're talking about. Isn't that funny? Yay, that, free uh, will. Yay, yay, free, free will. will. Yay, free will. Yay, free will. More free will. My will is not free enough. I need it to be more free. Come on, free will. So, Tony, does God oh. melt our free will or does he enhance our free will Can well God make our free will even more free he has to overwhelm our will with grace and love in christ jesus as he did paul you know, paul, that's, uh, that's paul's right will of, uh, that's right out of first corinthian uh, first timothy chapter one yeah. I don't um, think Josh C. understands Paul, this. Could you quote it again? Yeah. Uh, God overwhelmed Paul with faith and love in Christ Jesus. And he's a pattern for those who are about to be believing. So God, you know, I hear Christians often say, God is a gentleman. He would never make anybody get saved against their will. Well, yeah, he does. That's what he does. Mm -hmm. And he's a gentleman while he does it. <laughs> yeah, Josh, what do you got to say about the word overwhelms? God overwhelms Paul with faith and love. That doesn't sound very free willish. And besides, back to you, Tony. Does God strengthen a man's free will or does God melt a man's free will? Well, God's will becomes our will because God is operating in us to will as well as to work for the sake of his delight. Mm -hmm. So... We all have wills. I I don't think anybody can rightfully dispute that. We all have wills, but our wills are not free. They're not free from causality. Mm -hmm. If, let's say, um, you smoke cigarettes, and yeah. you see... You really love smoking cigarettes. It's very enjoyable. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you see commercials of people with hole, a hole in their throat. Yeah, please stop smoking and you'll end up like me with a hose in your throat. You know? And uh -huh. so the fear of that happening becomes greater than the enjoyment of you smoking and so you quit well the quitting wasn't free from cause there was a cause that was greater that that caused you to make a choice to stop smoking it wasn't uncaused you know it wasn't free it wasn't a free will choice the fear of dying was greater than the enjoyment. Right. It, it's kind of like salvation. Um, in Romans, it says, all avoid him. 
all avoid him. Here's God, and here here go we down the street, mm. and God is chasing after us. Come back here, come back here. No, no, I'm avoiding you. Get away, get away. And God keeps running down after us, you know. And so God has to intercept us as we flee him because we avoid him. Mm -hmm. And so God, God gets in our face and he overwhelms us with faith and love. And that is a hell of a testimony that God overwhelms us with faith and love. Because if you don't yeah. see that, you just might end up bragging on your free will. I became a Christian because I'm so smart that I repented of my sins and I obeyed. Aren't I smart? Aren't I cute? Aren't I clever? Too bad you're going to hell, but not me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm smart. Yeah, instead of singing Amazing Grace, why don't they sing Amazing Will, How Great Thou Art? <laughs> amazing Free Will. <laughs> Let's all sing together. Amazing, amazing Will. Free Will, How Great, great the Sound. <laughs> This Let's is the song of Josh. Yeah. And you can have a girl up there tap dancing. That'll work. Yeah. I I visited a church that my friend plays electric guitar in. Yeah. And the message was on God's sovereignty. Oh my. And this this guy who was giving the sermon was a young guy and he waffled back and forth that you know it's really hard to to find out if God is thoroughly sovereign or if we have some will, you know, and he just went back and forth, back and forth. And that's how he ended the sermon. He didn't want to commit. Mm -hmm. That's really a sad state of affairs when you can't commit one way or the other because he didn't want to lose people who put money in the basket. Yeah. Because if he'd have said, we save ourselves by our free will, some people might have walked out. If he would have said, God saves us and not our will, people probably would have walked out. So he had to be kind of like Solomon and cut the baby in half, you know? Right, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, pastors are more and more politicians these days. They want to make everybody happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I can see where a person would believe in free will. I really can. But I can't see where they can believe that in salvation, mm -hmm. I can see where they might believe something like that in the everyday affairs of life, you know. Yeah. But, and, and actually, I, I think that it's best to stick with the scriptures and who saves who rather than did God make me brush my teeth this morning, you know?
I was laying in bed the other night. You want to hear something really weird? You want to know what I think about when I lay in bed? Yes, I do. Before God created anything, was there even a universe with nothing in it? I mean, was there at least a universe? Or was there not even a universe of no stars and planets and just no universe at all, just God? And I, I got to really thinking about that. Wow, that is a freaky idea, you know? That absolutely nothing, not even the universe existed until God created it. What do you think about that? I think you're onto something. I mean, it does say all is out of him. Yeah. Or him. But, um, yeah. I mean, was there just nothing? Not even the vastness of space? Did God spread space out like a tent? It says he spread the heavens out like a tent. Yeah. But, uh, and then you've, well, anyway, sometimes I just like to think of these things when I'm lying in bed. They help me go to sleep and, you know. You young rascal, you. Who said that? It was me, my lord, your wannabe patron, St. Tommy. Oh, Tommy, hey. Tommy gets a thumbs up. How are you doing, Tom? Uh, thank you, St. Tommy. St. Yeah. Tomas. Whenever Saint I do that, I hear... <laughs> you know us Trinitarians. So how, yeah. <laughs> how have you been? Oh, getting my share of how suffering been, in. Um, getting my share of suffering in. How's my yeah. audio? Sounds okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So who, what, what do you guys think about the current state of affairs in the world as far as, um, like using, uh, well, we probably shouldn't say it because we may, may get our show uh, taken well, down, I, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but... With the burning of Maui and the burning of South America, these major cities that were, I'll just, let's just say that they were heavenly torched. It does appear okay, that can way. Can we yeah. at least say that? Right. But Pretty freaky, yeah. Um, but I, I have nothing to say about it. Except but that. Do you think that Except that governments along with, throughout history, governments throughout history are famous for killing their own people. So, yeah, but even with the cashless society we're entering into more and more, do you think that the man of lawlessness could be at hand? I don't know because I, I don't. I don't ever remember a cashless society in world history. I mean, even the Indians had wampum. Mm -hmm. They traded, you know, with things, you know. We make fun of the Indians 
trading for beads and things. And yet yeah. we use a piece of paper mm -hmm. and pieces of metal that are worthless, basically. You know, so what's the big difference? Um, it It is a form of barter. But uh, I heard just the other day that they're going to start putting these um, little things under your skin and the banks will give you two thousand dollars a month if you do that and that's all you make you live on two thousand dollars a month aren't they just so clever what can possibly go wrong yeah but you know what i thought if they give you nothing's for free, if they give you two thousand a month, then they can say you have to live where we tell you to live, and you have to work where we tell you to work, and you can only. And they're even saying they're going to allot so many calories per day per person, and so. It just seems like everything is uh, working toward a one-man, one-world government run by the man of lawlessness. Right. What, do you think that that could be, or do you think that could be another thousand years off? Or I personally think that uh, we don't understand it at all. That... Um, that most of the book of Revelation is filled with metaphors, analogies, and and figures of speech that are just impossible to really come to a conclusion about. Yeah, we think we know what the mark of the beast is, right? It says 666, and how can we say that this computer chip in our hand is going to be the mark of the beast? Well, if, it, if that's the line of thinking, we've had the mark of the beast since the Roman Empire. Because in the Roman Empire, there's still placards up on the walls of the town center where they would hold, you know, swap meets and, and farmers markets and stuff. And the placard was it put up there by the Roman government. And the placard said, you must take Roman coins or you will be killed. Well, that's a mark of the beast. Because the reason they had to say that was because that was when the Roman government took silver coins, melted the silver down, and blended it with crap metal. So the people knew it was crap metal. So the people refused to take Roman coins until this sign showed up that said, you must take Roman coins or you will be killed. So that was a kind of mark of the mm. beast. You can't buy or sell without the mark of the beast, which in that case was the Roman coinage. So are we far off from what about I mean, during what about during World War II? The Germans had the mark. It was called the Deutsche funny. Mark, and that's so funny. And, that be the mark? and the Americans had uh, these pieces of paper uh, that said you can only buy three gallons of milk a month or three gallons of gas a month. What was that called? <coughs> Coupon rationing. Wasn't that oh, yeah. a mark of the beast? Uh, Tony, Tony, I yes. recently heard, I recently heard that things are getting better simply because we're closer to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That things are getting better because because the, either the rapture or the second coming, we're closer to it. Yeah, we'll tell that to all the Christians getting killed in Pakistan. <laughs> yeah, they're getting promoted early, I guess. Um, yeah. And and Africa, they're really the Muslims over in Africa are killing off a lot of Christians.
they go into villages and with machetes and hack off arms and all kinds of stuff. It seems like they just don't like Christians very well. But anyway, and then there's the new world order of churches, isn't there, where they're going to have three different buildings for three different groups? I heard, I heard from Linda Edmondson, Sister Linda Edmondson, that they've got three red heifers over in Israel and, and, with, with, and they're hot to rebuild a temple. And they've got three red heifers ready to go. They bought them from Texas. Yeah. I don't know what it means. I'm not an eschatologist. That's what I heard. Well, all they have to do is build it on the hill where the city of David was. You know, it's not in Jerusalem proper. The city of David was outside of the city of Jerusalem. And the, uh, Dr. Ernest Martin said that th there used to be a temple there because that's where the Guyon Spring is. Wow. But, yeah, I heard. So they yeah. don't have to tear down the mosque that's, that's in Jerusalem to do it. Have you ever heard of the Well of Souls? No, the Well of Souls? Yes. It's allegedly a oh. some type of well location that sits between, it sits in an open courtyard, and uh, rumor holds that the Ark of the Covenant is whirled down in there under the Well of Souls. And uh, yes, the mic. Okay. I don't know. I just wonder where they go. I'll tell you, if I found the Ark of the Covenant, I probably might not open it. I might, but I might not. You might not what? If I found the Ark of the Covenant, I might not open it. Even though God has made me holy, I still would be reluctant to open the Ark of the Covenant oh, yeah. after that Indiana Jones movie and all. Well, it's kind of interesting in Revelation. It says, of course, and then we get back to Linwood here. But anyway, in Revelation, it says that the Ark of the Covenant comes down out of heaven. So oh, is yeah. that representative of something else? Maybe the Ark of the Covenant has been maybe the Ark of the Covenant has been in heaven all these years. Yeah, from the book of Revelation we just get one strange metaphor after another okay. strange analogy after another strange hey. sign and another strange symbol. How do you make heads or tails of it? Only the Holy Spirit. Only the right person. Only the Holy <laughs> Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can reveal such things. That's right. What is the seven? What is the seven yeah. lampstands all about? What is this woman who runs into the hills with a baby in her belly? What's that all about? What is this ten heads and five horns? Sure. Why did Moses cover his Someday head? when you're ready, I'll tell you. Cool. <laughs> What's up with that snake on a stick? What's up with crushing up gold and making him drink it? You know, when Christ comes back, he's going to be the savior of the world in that 
in in Revelation it says there will be an earthquake in which all the cities of the nations fall. It's going to be such a great earthquake that the earth is going to shake back and forth like a drunkard, you know. And so when Christ returns, I mean, all the bridges, all the roads are going to be trashed. All the skyscrapers are going to be falling down. All the water towers, you know, people are going to be starving to death. They're not going to have commerce, you know, like trafficking of food like they used to, where the semi would just pull up to the store and unload all the food and you go to the store, you know, it's all that is done. So when Christ comes back, he's coming back to a pretty well messed up earth. And even when the bowls are poured out and the scrolls are open, there's going to be a lot of damage done. A third right. of the Earth's inhabitants will be killed off here and killed off there. And Hold on. This is a new thought. Oh, my God. Hold on, Tony. Hold, hold so on. Maybe we'll... Maybe Just, when Christ returns, there will be a hundred people left on the earth. Oh my God, man. <laughs> That's amazing. Never thought of this. I don't even track with this stuff so much. You know, I don't really study it like the end times, maybe later or whatever. But if you go along with the whole story like that, like kind of the general belief that what Tony just said, I've never even thought of that because it would have to be like that. Mm. It would be like, like them trying to figure out those pyramids and who built those. You know, no one could do it anymore. We would be in the Stone right. Ages. We really would. We would lose our ability to find out how we made things. You know, all the data. Warehouses are gone. And they believe this has happened many times over. But I can't believe that you laid that out so simply and and that is the truth. It would be a wasteland. Oh. The uh, al Qaeda or however you pronounce that, that uh, star that hits the earth. It's not a star, but, you know, it's a comet. Yeah. Al-Qadama or whatever. It's the, yeah, we it turns all the water to poison. You won't be able to drink the water. You know, you've got all these people getting killed right and left. And then when Christ comes back, the beast and false prophet does battle with him, along with maybe, I don't know how many people, but he wipes out all those people and casts the beast and false prophet in the lake of fire. Um, I don't know. It's kind of weird. Hmm. But we're going to be above it all. We will be with Christ among the celestials when that's happening. That's why I don't really, I mean, I just, I can't get as much interest right now in trying to figure out the first part of it which is how to be okay with with not believing and believing and hoping and not hoping. Yeah. I hope I'm not sure I hope exactly that. what you mean by that. Just that we're all groping. And we, we don't know much of nothing. And so before I start trying to put puzzle pieces together about end times and, you know, mm -hmm. it's very difficult. And I get, I've gotten lost in it when I was in the Christian world. And I don't see what's at the end of it. If Christ did everything on the cross, I think we're all going to be okay. Well, yeah. But 
Christ did not die to save humanity from needful, loving correction. <laughs> and that's what the scrolls being opened and the bowls being poured is to correct humanity of their waywardness. Um, even the judgment at the great white throne, Christ did not die to save mankind from being corrected for the wow. way they acted. Because wow. they're judged according to the acts, not as to if they had faith or not. And so God is into straightening things out. Let's put it that way. Like, um, God will tell this person, I know why you stole from that person, but that person needed stolen from so that they could learn what it's like to be stolen from. You know what I mean? Yep. And there, everything is going to be justified. Romans 5, 18 and 19. What Christ did will justify every man's or every human's life. Set it straight. You know, um, so that's interesting, Tony, to say, okay, at that great day, you will have an, to give an account of yourself to God. And God will say, you stole a lawnmower from your neighbor, Jimmy. But Jimmy needed that lawnmower to be stolen because I needed him to have the emotional experience in order to bring him along, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. wow. So both you stealing and Jimmy being stolen from, they result in a good thing Wow! in the purpose of God, in the justification of all humanity. I know no, I get no, let's also look at the great worldwide flood in Noah's day. Is anybody going to accuse God of being unfair that he did that to them? I don't think so. Number one, they're going to see what a great miracle it is that God just brought them into existence to begin with. Mm -hmm. Because... For eternity now, they get to experience God's love. But God has to show them why they had to die in the worldwide flood. Mm. God will set them right on that. Can't you see God sitting there just laughing at people being so pissed off at, at being killed? Or wiped out or cut short. He's laughing and he would just say, Why are you what why? You're here now. You're here. Yeah, really. That, exactly. that alone, this is what you just said. I mean, he would be able to sit there and laugh like a sweet, warm father at this whole thing because he could just say, You're here now. You're not hurting. Don't you feel good? Yeah. You're alive. And you have these thoughts. Often you when I these... get out of it. Yeah. But I, I was just going to say often when I get out of bed and plant my feet on the floor, I say, it just overwhelms me that God brought me into existence and I just thank him for that. You know, yeah. nothing can be so bad as to make that not worthwhile. If I was in a Chinese concentration camp for the rest of my life in a three foot by three foot cage, that pales in comparison to God bringing me into existence. Can we just hang out there for a second? That's amazing. 
I am going through the catastrophes of the worst ways to die and the worst ways to live. And I'm still adding up what you just said, that formula. And it comes out, you're, you're right. Nothing would compare to being set right, set free in your mind, being able to feel and have these five senses and more and think and then never die and always have that good, you know, that good feeling when you wake up those days, whenever your chemistry's right, you've ate right, you haven't eaten bad, you feel great. Just to feel, just to be yeah. like that forever, nothing would compare even the Chinese concentration camp. Nobody at the other end of that that would stand in a line and watch all of that, everybody in that line that never had the opportunity to live, you can't tell me one single one of those things that aren't alive yet wouldn't raise their hand and say, I'll do that. That's fine. For this, absolutely. Here, lay me on the table. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, go ahead, cut my sinews out, pull out my fingernails. Go ahead. It's only going to last 120 years. Mm -hmm. I have a hard time thinking that God giggles at suffering. Oh, I, I have a hard would. time with that. I figured you would. That's okay. You'll get over it. I hear. I hear. God is grieved. He's grieved sometimes. You know. You got. You I'm, got the wrong I'm chain not, letters. All. Uh, Those chain letters don't work. You know, Tommy. I'd give it up. Oh, you haven't heard about Percy grieving Paul the Holy Spirit? Say, yeah, Paul does say, do not be causing sorrow to the Holy Spirit. Man, I'd be careful, Tommy, because you're accusing God of, you know, you're implying that God's stupid. Since he can't laugh at this, you're implying that all kinds of silly things about God. He better says be able you, to formally laugh at this. He better have a plan you, to back it up. Or he can't justify that, himself to everyone that's suffered. How about that chain ladder that Tony referred to? Sorrow, God, yeah. God already has declared the end from the beginning, so he already knows the suffering we go through is for our good. And, and the Bible does say God is the happy God and that Christ is the happy and only potentate. Well, so on, I cautious. think they're happy because... Huh? Go ahead. Keep going. You think they're happy because what? I didn't. Yeah, mean to I think they're happy because they know the end result of everything. That Christ has done everything to straighten everything out. I think they hate it too that God even says that he he crinkles things and then makes them straight. I think they hate that he hides truth from us. You know, for, for, and it makes it our um, glory to find it. So, Tony, can you read the verse on the screen for us? I don't think you heard Jace. Oh, he's on mute. Tony, you're oh. on mute. Click yourself on unmute. Um. Uh, okay. For to vanity was the creation subjected, not voluntarily, 
but because of him who subjects it in expectation that the creation itself also shall be freed from the slavery of corruption into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Now, why would Josh see, I see and Peter W? Why would Josh C. and Peter W. hate this verse? <laughs> I see free will in every word of that verse. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. It might be easy to tell another man what he hates. Yeah, sounds presumptive to me. Right. Yeah, that coming from somebody with uh, I, I Willer's butt hurt. I'm I'm sorry. I have I ever... These two verses up. I'm Go sorry, ahead, Tony. Go ahead. I brought these two verses up with uh, ordinary Christians. Let's put it that way. Uh, I and I would ask them, do you see it? If if the entire creation is going to be brought into the freedom of the children of God, then the children of God can't be the only ones to ever be saved. And they would say, there's no talking about people. I said, well, it sure isn't talking about sticks and weeds and pebbles and, you know. Oh, I made it in. Because That's sticks and weeds were not subjected to vanity. You know, they weren't uh, put into the slavery of corruption. Only beings are. Amen. For to vanity was the creation subjected against their will, not voluntarily, but because of him who subjects it in expectation. Now, I've never met I've never I've never met an ordinary Christian. But because of him who subjects to be one. But because of him who subjects it in expectation, a grand expectation that the creation itself also shall be free from the slavery of corruption into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Hey, what do you make of them apples there, the Josh? Like Go ahead, Tony. I'm waiting for Josh and Peter. I was wondering how long you would keep me in purgatory for another eon, maybe. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm waiting for my therapist to uh, send me the invoice <laughs> so I can forward it to you because you drive yeah. me crazy. His, his, I heard that his butt his butt hurt is healing, Jill. Don't worry. <laughs> Did you hear that? I heard that Japan. He let me in. I was going to say I, that. I cut you up with the word of God last time, so it, it, it took you some time to heal. So tell us, uh, Jill, will creation be set free from the slavery of corruption into the glorious freedom of the children of God? Well, if God is like you, I'll eventually get in. Will creation <laughs> keep clicking on the link? <laughs> Will creation be set free from the slavery of corruption into the glorious freedom of the children of God, true or false? Oh, yes, true. The children of God, yeah. But he's got that as a select group, just for the audience's sake. That's true. He's slippery. you got to watch him. If you are sovereign over your channel, why can't so God be sovereign over salvation? See? You, you allow people in. You don't allow others in. Why can't God have the same freedom? I'm not God. I'm just, I'm easily annoyed by jealousness. <laughs> so God, so you're sovereign over your channel, but God's not sovereign over the universe. He didn't say that. You said that. 
we we <laughs> believe that in in Christ we are already transferred into his kingdom. Colossians 1. Uh, Tony, feel free to uh, join in here because you're the honored guest for this Saturday, March 23rd. Jill is oh, come on. a sideshow. Who's Jill? <clears throat> okay, I'll... You want the absolute? You want the absolute answer or the relative? That's answer? Jill. <laughs> yeah. He's our brother. He's our brother in Christ. He's our brother in Christ that some of us like to pick on. Yeah. You're my Jill, uh, Tony Jill is a pretend Calvinist. He uh, he feigns Calvinism. But is Jill Jill is a girl? No, it stands, yes. for, it stands for Jesus is Lord. Oh, okay. But uh, he's got it that Jesus so, is a uh, partial Lord or something like this. It's Lucifer. Jesus is Lucifer. Oh. You know, Judas was the honored guest at the Last Supper. Yeah, yeah right up to the end. <laughs> <laughs> And then Jesus died for Judas. Isn't that something? And Judas is very sin. Judas is very sin brings about his salvation. Yes. Amen. And I was talking to uh, St. Gregory of uh, Alabama. Was it this morning, St. Gregory? Yeah. About, yeah, how the, the Sanhedrin, they put Christ to death, and that will eventuate in their salvation, just as Joseph's brothers thought that they could get rid of Joseph by selling him off into Egypt. And that would put an end to his dreamy dreams, you know. And that was the very means of their salvation. So Adam sinning was the very means of bringing forth the Savior. Okay, because right after he sinned, God said, hey, I'm... I'm going to have a, you have a seed. There's going to be a seed come from you, and he's going to hurt the head of the serpent, and the serpent's going to hurt his heel. Um, so all these things are justified. It's just amazing how brilliant God played it all out. You know, I, 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 Satan entering into Jews of, Judas thought he could get rid of Christ once and for all. You know, he just didn't see that Christ would be resurrected. If he did, the Bible said, if they knew what was going to happen, they would not have crucified to find the Lord of glory. Amen. <clears throat> they really thought they were getting rid of this guy. And yet it was their salvation that will come about. Their act. Only God could pull that off. <laughs> Amen. And, and God bringing the entire creation into the glorious freedom of the children of God is not just willy-nilly done. It's not done from a causeless standpoint. The cause is the blood of Christ's cross, Colossians 1.20. 
The blood of Christ's cross brings about the reconciliation of all in the heavens and all on the earth. The reconciliation of all doesn't happen just for nothing. It just doesn't happen out of thin air. God doesn't save all mankind just because he wants to. It's because Christ gave himself a ransom for all. 1 Timothy 2, 6. So all of these things are based on what Christ has accomplished. You mean the and Lord Jesus Christ? Like, yeah. Are you familiar with Rob Bell? I've heard of him. He's a emergent church leader. The book Love Wins. Love is going yeah, to win in the end. I know. Is Rob is Mr. Yeah. Bell a Dominionist? I have no idea. Is Most what? of them are. Is Mr. A Dominionist? Bell what? A dominionist. I don't know, but I know his face sure rings a bell. <laughs> that was bad. That was a bad joke. He believed in ultimate reconciliation. I mean, he cites... Um, Matthew 17. So he cites from the gospel of the evangel. Ace. Oh no. And of course, Colossians 1. I hope he's right. Yeah, God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. It's more than a desire. It's his will. Yeah, first Timothy chapter three, I think. First two verse four through six. Oh, you, yeah, you, you know that passage, don't you? Resistance is futile. Resistance is futile. You will be assimilated. <laughs> Do you, do you think that God would not be loving and great if he was unwilling to save everyone? Is that your belief? Yeah. What kind of question is that? <clears throat> well, a question Calm that down. Jill's asking. Calm down. Would, you, would you conclude that God is not great and loving if he's unwilling to save everyone? Not to those that he didn't save. Of course. Of course. What about you? What do you mean? Would you conclude that God is not great or loving if he's unwilling to save everyone? I think he would be a foolish builder. Wow. Could have been building people and creatures with feelings, you know, and sensors than being foolish like that and deciding to build. Yeah, that's pretty freaking evil. A waste of humanity. Lots of suffering for apparently no purpose. You know what? What I answer to the common Christian that says all mankind deserve hell. I say, I say, actually, all mankind deserve to be saved because Christ ransomed all mankind. God doesn't just want to save all mankind. He has to because Christ ransomed all mankind. He must save all mankind. Wow. And it's based on the ransom. It's based on the what? In the, the Old Testament. 
in the Old Testament, any human or animal that was ransomed had to be freed. It wasn't, well, I, I desire to let you go free, but no, they must go free. And so fast forward to 1 Timothy 2, verse 4 through 6. God wills that all humans be saved, for Christ gave himself a ransom for all. Wow, say that again. So God, huh, say what? That, 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 6. Again? Yeah. Oh, I thought you meant for me to say that again. That again. Again. <laughs> um, God wills that all mankind be saved for, that's a causal conjunction, for, or the reason why this is so is, there's only one God, and there's only one mediator of God and man, or humans, or human beings, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, or a correspondent ransom for all, to be testified in its own time. So God is obligated to save all mankind. He has to. It's not that he wants to. It's not that he desires to. It's that he will do it. God who wills that all mankind be saved and come to a realization of the truth, for there is one God and one mediator of God and man, a man, Christ Jesus, who is giving himself a correspondent ransom for all the testimony in its own eras. Good news for Josh C. Jesus Christ is giving himself a correspondent ransom for all. And Brother Tony Do you know said, what happened to Israel? What happened? When, when Moses called down all the plagues and stuff on Egypt, did any of those free Israel? No. What freed Israel? I'll tell you. It's when God ransomed Israel by the death of the firstborn Egyptians. Wow. So they had to die like the law that the Hebrews lived under. Their, their sons or their firstborn, yeah, their firstborn sons had to be used as that. No. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, they are, in a way, a type of Christ. Christ is the firstborn uh, of all mankind. Um, Colossians 1, 15, 16, 17. Because he is firstborn, he must ransom all who are related to him mm -hmm. okay and now the firstborn egyptians wait, wait, wait. So aren't just law. little babies they're, they're not little babies they're one of the firstborn of pharaoh i think was older than moses mm. when he was killed to free israel so once Israel was ransomed, they were freed. Now, God doesn't free all mankind at the same time, each in his own order, right? Right. Or each in his own class. And that's where we get 1 Timothy 4.10, God is the Savior of all humans, especially them that believe. 
So we get an especial salvation of life for the coming eons that the unbeliever does not get, but they eventually do get salvation. They have to because Christ ransomed them. This is the nail in the coffin of the eternal tormentous idea that God will not save all mankind. You, you just cannot get around this. It's impossible. The only way to do it is to not be fair with this fact and to say, well, I just don't believe that. You have to say, I just don't believe Christ ransomed everyone. Yeah, I think I always have to like change my brain to start thinking like Jill because he'll agree that he's tracking or agreeing. Like when he says amen, it's not really amens. So I guess he has to, when, he, when we read who is giving himself a correspondent ransom for all those that are the select few in Christ that he chooses not to um, annihilate. That's how he has to read it. And then he'll say, amen, amen, like he agrees with you, but he's really going to be able to fall back and say, oh, no, that's not the ransom for all. That's for all those in Christ. All right. Well, my brother Terry, who went through, uh, it's like Moody Bible Institute. I forget the name of the school. But he said, yes, God will save all mankind. I believe that. I believe he will save all mankind who aren't in hell. Who aren't in hell, right. I know. Well, Thomas Aquinas <laughs> uh, explained it this way. He said, hence it may be said of a just judge that and, uh, that he wills all men to live. Um, just like a judge may will all men not to go to jail or prison, but consequently wills the murderer to be hanged. So in the same way, God wills all men to be saved, but consequently wills some to be damned, as his justice it demands. Uh, I'm, I'm not quoting him verbatim, but that's basically what he what he argued. And the queen's well, that is true. Everyone. That that is true to a degree. God damns certain people, but we have to ask for how long. The Bible never says he damns them for eternity. That would be impossible because Christ ransomed them. Um, so, you know, I can agree with him to a degree, uh, but I don't agree that it is an irremedial damnation. Romans 5, 18 and 19 disprove an irremedial damnation. Every human that was affected by Adam is positively affected by what Christ did. Romans 5, 18 and 19. You can't get around that. You just can't. Um, you can lie to yourself and say it doesn't mean what it says, but it does mean what it says. A friend of, um, family member of mine has uh, served in the Marine Corps for a number of years. He said uh, he overheard a conversation with the chaplain and um, one of the army sergeants. And uh, they were interviewing the chaplain and the army brigade leader said, do you believe in hell? 
the chaplain said, no, I do not. And then he said, well, you, well, you need to resign because there's no hell. We don't need you. <laughs> uh, I guess you didn't find that. My joke funny. I'm... I, I don't get the joke. Maybe it, I didn't hear it properly because you were sounded too loud in your microphone. Oh, let me, let me lower my volume. Is this a joke, Ace? It, it's... Okay, he needed to quit being a minister because of what? Well, they, they interviewed him for the position of chaplain. And during the interview, they asked him if he believed in hell, and he said no. So then they told him to resign because if you don't believe in hell, we don't need you. Oh, okay. <coughs> oh, no one's laughing. I don't think. Well, I had. don't quite get the joke. Mine there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Donna got it. Donna got it. <laughs> All right. Do do any of you like Mr. Bean? Oh, I love Mr. Bean. He there's a video. Mr. Bean is in hell, and he's the devil in hell. It is so funny. Oh my gosh, you gotta you gotta see it. I thought I've seen all of Mr. Bean. Is that the actual movie, or is that? His. It's a video. It's it's like a, a seven to eight minute video. I don't know. Yeah, he. That's the only man it's, that can make me laugh without saying a word. Maybe Jim Carrey. Well, he ta he, he talks in this video. You know, but it's so funny. He he just nailed it. You know. Pee Wee Herman in hell. But he. Well, it's always uh, sobering to remember that the first doctrine to be rejected in Scripture is in Genesis 3. You surely will not die. Yeah, we we believe you, that humans will die, but God didn't say you'll go to hell forever if you eat. That's right. right. Dying is a serious situation, but. The invention of eternal conscious punishment mm -hmm. is another thing altogether. And, and, and that, for that would have been the perfect time. That would have been the perfect time to let the cat out of the bag for God to tell them about eternal hellfire and damnation. But why did he keep it a secret all of those thousands and thousands of years? Why did he use the word only in verse 6 instead of all? <laughs> and actually, all mankind is... In the Greek, all humans. Ooh. Not just Calvinists, not just the believer, but all humans. And he's already been broader by using creation, all creation. So now he wants you to realize right. how intimate it is for you since you're a human. You might be a green one, a Calvinist one, a 
a dumb Christian one. What about my pet snake? Creation. The Rockwaller? You know, Creation. there's this um, Hillsdale College that is in Michigan. And on Facebook, one of the theologians at the college is talking about the serpent speaking to Eve. Now, we know that serpents don't talk, you know? I mean, that's the common unbelief that we get because we, today we don't hear serpents talking, right? I mean, we just, right. ha I've never heard a what serpent this, talk. No. Now, what about this? Huh? Do you believe it? What about this now? This is something I kind of just don't pay much attention to. Were they really talking or were these thoughts? Well, going let, on me, let me get to that. Okay, I don't know. Let me get to that. Let me get to that. Uh, this is a true story. This uh, zoo, they took care of animals, of course, you know. But th there was this one, like a leopard, or not a leopard, but it was like one of those big cats, you know. And he would not come out of his cage into the big yard that they had for him, you know. And so they called this woman there who has a gift of communicating with animals. The zookeeper thought it was a bunch of baloney that she's got this ESP, this power to communicate on a deeper level with animals, okay? So anyway, she's communicating back and forth with this cat. And he's saying he doesn't trust you to come out because he thinks you're going to make him do things he doesn't want to do. And, they, and so the zoo, zookeeper said, oh, well, whatever, you know. And... Um, I asked him about what he was also sad about, and he said he didn't know what happened to the two cubs. And the zookeeper freaked out because when they captured this <clears throat> cat, there were two young cats there also. And so uh, she asked him, what should I tell him? I, I don't know what, what happened to the two cats. And so the zookeeper told her that they're well taken care of. He doesn't have to worry about. So she communicated that to the cat. And anyway, it, it kept going back and forth. She kept finding out more things that the zookeeper was freaking out about that only he would know. You know? There was no way this woman could possibly know that. And so after uh, she told the cat through telepathy, okay, I've told him he doesn't have to worry about you making him do anything and the cat started coming out and the the zookeeper told the cat you are really a pr very beautiful cat in an outward voice you know and the cat started doing this certain roaring and everything and so they brought her back to ask her what was going on and she said, well, he was telling you that he was very happy that you thought he was a beautiful animal. And that was his way of telling you. 
So anyway, I think it's very possible that Eve was able to communicate with the serpent on a telepathic level. I know it sounds new age-ish, but I can't no, help I, it, you I'm know. Often wondered. Well, it's, it's either that or the snake could speak Eve. I mean, either the snake was the yeah. snake was speaking human, or she was communicating with the snake, or she was speaking snake. One, one of the three. If I, or maybe I she was tripping. Well, after <laughs> hearing the story, after hearing the story, <laughs> if I was the, if I was a, was it a zookeeper? Was it a zookeeper that was the, the guy? Yeah, it was the head of the zoo. Him. Okay. I'd pass this on to my son. I'd say, hey, you run into this situation again. I've thought about it. Here's how you can totally take advantage of these, you know, powers that these these people have or never be bothered by this again. Either way, because people are on the fence, you know. I would simply tell my son, look, agree to the same thing, but say, hey, one of the stipulations is you, you you got five minutes to make your acquaintance, but you must continue the rest of the negotiation in the cage with the leopard. Uh -huh. And then I'll do whatever you say that the leopard wants, and I'll pay you whatever you want to, to tell me what he's saying. I don't know. Yeah. It's either that they were really all talking and we've lost that ability, or maybe it's something else. I don't know. I've, all, I've often thought about it, just because that seems so preposterous to us. Right. But, I mean, I do believe Satan possessed that serpent because... He is called the serpent, you know, and um, it's possible Satan spoke through that serpent just as Balaam's donkey spoke to him, you know. Right. God opened the mouth of that donkey. Somehow, I don't know if he used telepathy or not. Right. And you see what I mean by so if influence? He, if you heard an animal speak right now, Tony, you are not going to receive those spoken words with the same emotions, the same thoughts as you would if that just came out of a human being that you hear talk every day. So it either shocked her, well, you, and that was a part of the persuasion, or they were used to hearing animals speak things. There are birds that speak intelligently, and they know what they're saying. Like certain yeah. parrots speak speak very intelligently. Uh, Sterling, I don't know if you know Sterling Perry. Mm -hmm. He's a Greg DePlaron's friend and my friend. He had some parrots, and if a parrot would squawk. Sterling would say, you're going to get the bottle. In other words, he'd spray it with water, you know. And one day, this one parrot was squawking, and the other parrots were saying, you're going to get the bottle. <laughs> That's funny. So they knew, you know. Yeah, I think that animals can communicate. We just have lost that ability to interpret what they're saying. Like we're unable to understand bees. Bees will dance a certain way back and forth to tell the hive how far the flowers are away from the hive and which direction they are, you know. So we know that bees communicate with each other certain ways. You know, ants, ants have ways of communicating too that we've been learning how to decipher. 
Oh, there used to be this uh, chimpanzee they taught um, sign language. I've seen that one. And they were teaching. He had all these oh. words, you know, signs for these words. And the lady showed him Coco. a bracelet on her, her wrist. And the, the uh, chimp had never seen it before. And she asked him, what do you call this? And he gave the sign language for finger and ring. It's like a finger ring. Cool. But he made that up. It's what he called it, you know. Yeah. Wild so, apes like in different countries where tourists are, they'll steal things, you know, like sunglasses and sit there and barter with you and, you know, wait for you to give them food or a snack, a bag of snacks or something. They'll throw your sunglasses back at you. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's pretty hilarious. They learned that. They don't want the sunglasses. They've already stolen so many. They, you know, they, they've lost their novelty, but they know we want them. And wallets and purse, you know, or scarves, stuff like that. They'll snatch it, stand there with it, wait for you to give them, trade them food for it, and give it back to you. When I was a kid, I used to watch the talking horse, Mr. Ed. Oh, yeah. That's a joke. Of course. Art of course. That was horrible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Wilbur. There you go. He had perfect teeth, too. Wilbur. Damn, <coughs> I remember that because that was my dad's name. But anyway, you know. There was a documentary. That, uh, Adam and Eve. There was a documentary yeah. called Planet of the Apes about all these talking monkeys. Maybe you saw it. I, it was a documentary. I don't know if I saw the... I don't think I saw the documentary. I saw the movie. They were, oh. Of the eight. It wasn't a documentary? I saw it three times, and every time those apes were talking. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> man. If if there was any, um, you know, if if that was found out to be a lot of truth to that, maybe these big bold, you know, these big infrastructures that we can't lift and everything. What if what if there was these, you know, herds of, I don't know, whatever animals were around. I don't know it's fun to think about. All right. I think that they've been deciphering elephant language for quite a while now. They have a, a really interesting community, you know, a kind of language. Yeah. Maybe they're the animals are highly intelligent, but just narrow in scope, you know. Oh yeah, sure. Concentrating on you know making a habitat and food and making whatever that that is, but I don't know. I know they do talk to each other. They read body language. There's that lady that swims, you know, with wild sharks, twelve, fourteen foot tiger sharks, and. She's telling you the, the uh -huh. first thing you need to do is make eye contact because the shark is looking for, for animals that are fearful and they won't make eye contact and that's the sign that you're prey. But if you make eye contact and act not afraid, well, that means that you might be a predator and I might be prey. I don't know. So hmm. she, she tells you to look them dead in the eye. So they read body language and have, sound. I know that. Have goggles with massive eyes, you know, on on the goggles. There you go. I didn't think of that. There you go. 
eyes on the back of your 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 yeah. strap a pair of eyes on your you know your mask band. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Things like that. There was this there was this one woman who was swimming and this whale came up and started pushing her. It and the whale just she didn't know why. And it comes come to find out the whale was trying to save her from a shark yeah, that was that. in the area that was gonna kill her. Yeah. Amazing. So you never know. Well, I know. Certain well, times I'm going to have life. to go. So glad you came in, Tony. Thanks, Tony. Take care, friends. I appreciate all of you. We all love Thanks, you Tony. You got me worried about what all the damn animals have seen that I don't want anyone to see or tell anyone now. I'm trying to make sure they're all dead. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Bye bye, Tony. Have a good one. Take bye -bye. care. I like you guys. Bye bye. I like you too. Same. Gracious, lovely man. Still here, Justin? Justin! He had to go out and cut down the banana trees. He's spinning rolls of paper right now, feverishly, as you call. I think Tony's getting a little cocky there with that beard of his. <laughs> he says he's going to grow it two feet long. That thing's as rad as can be. I really like it. Looks good on him. It does look good on him. God, who wills that all mankind be saved and come into a realization of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator of God and mankind, a man, Christ Jesus, who is giving himself a correspondent ransom for all. The testimony in its own eras. Man, there's so much to unpack in these two verses. I bet you that in heaven, this is the public school's Pledge of Allegiance right here. Can't you just see all of us little kids standing there? Not yet, I can't. But it <laughs> I mean, this, the last few words here, the testimony in its own errors, that is a time construct. Yeah. That would speak to what's your hurry. Give, give God time to pull it all together. realization of the truth that's also a time construct giving himself a correspondent ransom that's kind of a a timeless construct what was the one before before giving himself that you were going that you had mentioned you put in a, a realization one. of yeah. the truth yeah that's that's what I think this is so dependent on something about this us these creatures he built the way our minds work it's something big to do with this coming to these revelations that that imprints us somehow in our in our being this having a new thought is huge to God I, it's, it's just an important way that he it's it's even in the way he tells us to train our children you know, this imprinting these things, capturing these moments, you know, it's like, oh, don't spank the dog. If, if you're too, if he poops on the floor, 
and you wait too long, you know, don't spank him. He doesn't know what in the hell you're spanking him for. So, yeah. so God also capitalizes on these moments of revelation we have. They're very important in our in our changing and our becoming more and more like Him. Yeah. Well, check this out. God wills that all mankind be saved. That would be interesting if it, if there was just a period right there that God wills all mankind to be saved, but he doesn't stop there. It's not just that he wills all mankind to be saved. He wills all mankind to be saved and come into a realization of the truth. Yeah. This is a, what, a double project? Not just save them, but make them realize the whole truth about the truth. Yeah. That is a big project underway. Not some cheesy little salvation, but a cheesy little salvation plus a realization of the truth. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and we have to admit we're being brought along on this journey because, you know, the common testimony on this channel is we used to be Christians, but we realized something right. bigger than what the right. Christian propaganda is. And that makes us be thankful, you know, and remind each other, oh, those are horrific stories and experiences, but we should be thankful for those because we wouldn't realize what we have now. Right, right, yeah. And so if Jill and his pals are going to bust up anything about this, four, five, and six, they have to bust the whole thing up because chat verse four is intimately tied to verse five, which says there is one God. And the fact that there is one God is a construct upon which we can say that God wills to save all mankind and come to a realization because there's only one God. He gets his way. There's no one to challenge him. There's no other gods out there to thwart his will. There's one God. Now, and now, we, Ace, don't poke Christ bear. That was, <laughs> that was nice. And one mediator. Was <laughs> There's only one mediator between God and mankind. A man, Christ Jesus, who is giving himself a correspondent ransom for all. So if you break up just one part of this verse, you were just th these three verses, you're destroying the total unified concept of all three verses. Yeah, Jill. Yeah, yeah, you would say so. Jill. Are you listening? Yes. Have you, uh, do you know about the biblical teaching concerning the kinsman redeemer in the Old Testament? Yes, yes. Uh, Boaz and Ruth. Yes, Boaz and Ruth, the kinsman yes. redeemer. And that from the biblical teaching of the kinsman redeemer, the one who needs to be redeemed has no choice about the matter. So I, yes. I know you pretend to be a Calvinist, but so the right. one who is being redeemed is redeemed regardless of his will about the matter. His, his firstborn kinsman comes along and redeems him without even talking to him. He's sitting in jail and the kinsman redeemer comes to redeem him and he doesn't even talk to the guy in jail, the family member in jail. Right. He, yeah, he just that, that, gets yeah. redeemed and you are thrown out. Oh, listen, Josh, see, this is for you too. It's a doctrine from the Old Testament called the, the doctrine of the kinsman redeemer. And so in the doctrine of the kinsman redeemer, the firstborn of the family has an obligation to look out over the family. And if a family member gets thrown into jail for being in debt or any other reason, the firstborn has an obligation to come along and redeem that family member. And we can see this in the story of Ruth and Boaz. 
and it's it's a complex teaching a complex cultural thing that they went through and if the kinsman redeemer did not redeem are you listening josh are you listening if the kinsman redeemer does not redeem the kinsman his name is to be blocked out of the lineage his name is to be so and so it's so in the story of ruth and boaz the first kinsman redeemer turned down the obligation to redeem ruth and his name was blocked out of the lineage and so Boaz was next in line and Boaz did fulfill the obligation and redeemed Ruth. And Boaz's name is listed in the genealogy in Matthew concerning Christ. He is one of the ancestors listed there of Christ. And if the kinsman redeemer does not redeem, his name is mud according to this doctrine, according to this cultural thing that they had going on. And we are told in the New Testament through the writings of Paul. Are you listening, Josh? Are you listening, Josh? That Christ is the firstborn of creation in Colossians 1, 15 and 16. Christ is the firstborn of creation. He has an obligation to redeem creation. And guess what? Because of the teachings of Paul, we know that Christ as the kinsman redeemer will get a name above all names because he successfully ransoms and redeems all and for in philippians 2 5 through 11 one of the great results of christ's work on the cross he humbles himself becomes a human obedient unto death even the death of the cross and the very next words say wherefore god gives him a name above all names this is directly tied back to this doctrine of the kinsman redeemer if the, the firstborn of the family, the firstborn of creation does not redeem creation, his name is to be mud. <laughs> his name is to be an embarrassment. He's blotted out of the, of the lineage, right? Well, a little house cleaning here real quick. I don't want anyone to think Ace is inefficient. There's just too many damn students. But Ace, just so it doesn't happen again and Jill gets frustrated, I did look it up on his... Um, his application form, student application form under his bio, and it says right here, my apologies, Jill, any Bible story, person, place, or thing, you no longer have to ask him if he knows about it. It says right here he knows about every one of them if they're in <laughs> the Bible. Sorry about that, Jill. Yeah, but that fits well with the reform position, but how do you fit that into someone being blotted out of the lineage how do you fit that into your universal reconciliation doctrine if christ doesn't redeem creation of which he is the firstborn of creation christ's name is to be mud christ's name is to be blocked out he doesn't get a name above all names right but the one who didn't do it his name is blotted out that's so the, the guy teaching. who didn't redeem christ. ruth uh-huh. His He's name is false blocked redeemer, out of the right? lineage, but this is this is just a minor thing oh, concerning okay. the, va the the outcome of all the destiny of all humanity. That's, so Ruth and Boaz are merely a foreshadowing of the story. Uh -huh. A minor analogy, like all of the Old Testament, there's only small aspects of the foreshadowing like the foreshadowing or the foretelling or the for uh, of jonah in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights of joseph being sold into slavery only to come back and redeem his family i mean every story in the old testament is a, a just a minor story telling of the entire complexity storytelling of uh -huh. christ and the redeemer as the redeemer of all humanity and all creation so you can't use just one passage to totally uh in, it doesn't totally encompass the the doctrine of universalism you have to combine mm -hmm. other passages um you know bitest the... me thou knave uh it says right here that he is giving himself a correspondent ransom for all okay the testimony in its own errors i'm just quoting the lovely scripture 
And you guys keep running to many passages to bust up the good news, to exaggerate the bad news. And I'm telling you, we've got every reason to limit the bad news and, and exaggerate the good news because the word gospel means good news, not bad news. We need to not hem Christ's work on the cross into a narrow box and saying it doesn't apply to anything except what we, you know, just me and my 17 Calvinist pals or Jesuit pals or whatever. 25. He is Bikers. a correspondent ransom for all. Okay. God wills that all mankind be saved. God wills that all mankind come to a realization of the truth. Right, so I can't so beat that. Sometimes you know, I can't beat that. Me. You, Just you can try it. and beat it, you and your Christian pals. <laughs> so sometimes it me, takes I want to make sure I heard that from correctly. Other gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Bitest thou me? I mean, is that right? Is that what you said? Yeah, I said, Bitest thou me, thou name. Bitest thou me. That's Jonah 25 25. Bite us down me. <laughs> Holy crap. That's a t shirt. Quote unquote, bite us down me. <laughs> all this fits in with grace, guys. Uh, God wills all this stuff to happen. And then he gives us the grace to let it actually happen. God gives and gives and gives and gives. Hey Jill, do you mind just because I want to know what it feels like? If you, if you, if you'd be so kind. Ready, Jill? Bite us yeah. thou me. Yeah. Bite us thou me. Yeah, not in scripture. Yeah, Even that, if you were to try to piecemeal together, hey, bite us thou several me. passages. Okay, so here's another lovely passage from the hand of Paul, First <laughs> Timothy one fifteen. Faithful is the saying. And worthy of all welcome that Christ Jesus came into the world to try to save sinners. No, Jill, he doesn't try to save sinners. No, he doesn't. He came uh -huh. into the world to save sinners. Not to make salvation possible, but to save sinners. For people like The you. only thing that we could possibly do to qualify for this deal is to be a sinner. And I think we, we got that one down pat, so... The story of Boaz, uh, do you think the false redeemer, do you think he will, uh, there, there's any justice for him being yes, of course. a false redeemer? Because Christ died for all on the cross, including Judas, Pharaoh, all them dead Egyptians, and the false redeemer. Okay, so he's and plotted Cain out. And Abel, Christ died for all. He came into the world to save sinners. The false redeemer sinned and thus qualified to be saved. And Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Don't we have some good news to proclaim? So he's he's blotted out for a short time, maybe an eon. And then he's added back into the lineage. The lineage. Into the, fa into the family. Yeah. The lineage becomes... You know, you, you're confessing with your mouth that you have a limited understanding of these things. So <laughs> you love to limit the efficacy of Christ's work on the cross. It looks like someone limited it before me. True or false, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. At the Allen Tulip. True or false, God wills to save all mankind. The traditions of True men false. killed Christ. Mm -hmm. I think false. I already answered that in, in this stream. But the testimony the, in its own eras. Do you I like time answered. constructs there, Jill? Do you like I think things I answered, to happen I, in the proper time? Uh, okay. I'm um, I think I answered that already, but I was being gracious because you had a, a special guest. So I didn't drill it home, but if you want me to now, I, I can. All right. True or false? The I'm testimony ready to be kicked, in its, in its basically. Eras. <laughs> uh, what's that? True or false? The last one, two, three, four, five, six words. The last six words in verse six right there on the screen. 
all of the Bible is true. All of the words in scripture are true. So will this play out in its all improper time? Yes, yes, at all in due time, in all its proper time, right? Okay, well then, are you now a universalist with us? Today is a day of salvation. <laughs> so love does indeed win for those who turn by faith to Christ. Does love ever fail? Love never fails. Amen. For those select few that he's in the club with. All 25 of us. <clears throat> How about the lost coins, Jill? How many different uh, lost stories does Jesus tell in a row? And what does Jesus do with all those lost things? All those what coins do with his clan. What did he do with his coin or his sheep that was lost? He went and found them. Amen. Okay, uh, listen, uh, Red Amen. and Cade, don't talk to him. He's annoying. <laughs> I just talked to uh, two Mormons in a Walmart parking lot and uh, pretty much very confidently shared some things about grace to them. They, they agreed about grace uh, somewhat. I just basically used the analogy of the, uh, the rose, the bouquet of roses that God gives to us is Jesus. Basically, I said, you know, who, who is the bouquet of roses? And he said, well, I think you're trying to say it's Jesus. I said, yeah, you're right. Amen. Uh, I said, do you think if you were a man and you wanted to give your girlfriend a bouquet of roses, would you expect that girl to try to pay you back with money? It's like, no. You get the idea. I mean, yeah, you might want her to pay you back in a certain way. <laughs> <clears throat> but, Don't buy roses. Buy orchids. Orchids last longer. But is salvation like a bouquet of roses where you do not pay for it? Yes, the answer is yes. God gives and gives and gives, and that's his grace. Grace. At the time giving, thanks to the Father who makes you competent for a part of the allotment in the saints in the light, who rescues us out of the jurisdiction of darkness. Does he just rescue a few? Rescues us. Is he only rescuing a few? That would be a respecter of person. Over and out. That would be a respect of persons. No, no, it wouldn't. If he just read because that decision was made before there were any before any persons existed. So he's not looking down and saying, Hey, look, I like Johnny's attitude. Okay, boys and girls, I'm gonna close up shop here now that uh, Jill is here to thoroughly annoy me and annoy you. So in oh. order to uh starve Walmart of uh, uh money that we would have to purchase for Tissues to wipe the blood from our ears. Suppositories. Oh, well, oh, yeah. it's it's a it's a laceration, not not blood from the ears, but a laceration. Bug spray. Anyway, so I'm going to end the show and thank you for showing up today. Thank you to Dirty Barment and Josh C and Peter W and C Jill. You're all just three members of a club of annoying opposers. Limitarians, one and all. Limitarians are the opposite of universalist. <laughs> they limit the efficacy of Christ's work on the cross to all who do something about it. But I contend that the something that is done is the work on the cross and it will capture us. It will overwhelm us with grace and faith. And it may take a while, but eventually every knee will bow and every tongue will acclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. And Christ will get the name above all names. Rejoice. And mosquito netting does not keep annoying Christians.